and I think we're ready to go. All right, so um, yeah, uh, for those who this is the first video you find of mine, uh, welcome. And uh, let me just start off by saying I am so glad I postponed my video because now I'll not only be able to make a better video than I was originally planning, a series of videos, but uh, <laughs> now I'll get to include some stuff about the new content. <laughs> Because uh, there's a few things that stand out right away that are going to alter my approach. Namely, there's new exploration targets, and I'm going to be exploring those right off the bat once we get playing. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying that it's probably going to be 30 minutes to an hour of me just rambling about these patch notes uh, before we get into the actual gameplay. Just fair warning. Uh, I will... When this video, when I, my stream finishes, I'm going to chop this into its own separate video. Uh, edit out some of the dead air at the start and whatnot. So uh, we'll have a nice, easy video so you can find these notes on the patch notes. Uh, what, I did this before with um, the last patch a year ago, and I was very happy with um, the response to that, even though I'm a you know, small-time guy with my small-time channel. Uh, people were happy with you know how I presented those notes, so I'm going to try and do that again today. Um, I did try to get a guest to come in, but I think, honestly, uh, video might just be more concise if it's just me rambling on by myself. Although, if you are in chat, feel free to chime in, and I will be more than happy to uh, talk more about the patch notes. Uh, so let's just go ahead and get off right away and... Uh, get off to a good start. Uh, we are talking about Star Sector 0.97A release, formerly known as uh, 0.96.1, I believe. Right, that's uh, down here somewhere, probably. When they, yeah, they changed, decided that all the new content was worthy of a new number, which I agree. There's a lot added to this. Uh, I'm going to go follow the reverse order of updates essentially the way it's presented in the forum post the meat of it is was up uh, was put up in January 1st in the patch notes that's where a lot of the stuff is that we're going to dive into deeply so I'm going to skim over most of this stuff up uh, on the, the later sections added to the post um, just so we can get to that chunkier section so uh, it looks to be that most of the February 2 stuff that's changed is just bug fixes. Although um, the proximity mine, uh, the proximity charge launcher being more frequently sold at Tritachion uh, instead of the Dictat. I didn't even realize that the Dictat was selling more of them. Uh, this is an item I think of as like a rare find when you find it out in the wild. I don't always see them quite that much. Um, and I don't tend to end up getting into any of the military markets where you actually find good weapons for sale. So I just didn't even notice that this was more available now. But now it makes sense to me that Tritachion would have it. So that's a quite nice change. Uh, the Dragonfire medium refire delay, the large refire delay. Um, I like the Dragonfires. I feel like they're not... They're not always worth equipping over Cyclone Reapers, but as like, cause my, I use the Wolf Pack. So a lot of times if I have a medium missile launcher, it's the primary weapon on the Vigilance. And to put the Dragonfire on there significantly reduces the ammo available considering how fast the Vigilance can fire. So I very rarely use the Dragonfire Torpedoes. However, they are very good. They're, they're, much easier to land than the uh, dummy-fired rockets that do the most damage. Um, the only thing is, though, is this is another situation where I feel like the AI does not use them as well as I would like. And I, so I feel like Dragonfire, while they're great as a, as a weapon overall, putting them in the AI hands, especially as their primary weapon, is just not going to work out in the long run. Definitely doesn't work out in my wolf pack. I'd much rather have a Cyclone Reaper launcher. Seems like they know how to manage that better. Whereas with Dragonfire, it's like I see them spam fire and just get absorbed completely by shields. Or they wait until uh, the target is completely disabled, in which case any weapon would have been 
good there, as opposed to the dragon fires. They just don't have the, the ammo count for me to really want to lean into them. So seeing them now with the refire delay, it's like I'm, I'm personally not going to notice that that much. And the change is mostly on the medium-sized ones, which I think is the least valuable of them. Because like I said, it takes a whole medium slot, and you only get like very few missiles. Hold on, let me open the game up real quick so I can bring up the codex. I don't remember, does the codex show weapons? I wanted the, the, to have the codex up anyway for the um, the new ship. As well as uh, I want to go over the skills. Uh, there's some skill changes in the patch notes as well. But real quick. Yeah, we can see weapons. Uh, Dragonfire, DEM. Yeah, this boy. So for 12 ordnance points, you only get 2 ammo. That's rough. That's That's really, really rough. Like, that's, in my opinion, just not at all worth it. Uh, the larger one gets five, which is a little bit better. It's still a lot of ordnance points to only get five shots. I think the assumption here is that you're going to put it on a ship that either can reload themselves, or that uh, like putting it on putting these side by side on the on the Griffin, for example, I think would be really good because you could fire off all of them really quickly. And this is probably where the refire delay kicks in because with the um, with the Griffin, I feel like the large missile mount is the primary. So, like, you're spending that before you reload. And then now you have to think about, you know, the Dragon Fires are going to take, like, if you have expanded missile racks, it could take, like, 30 seconds to a full minute if you have missile specialization to fully dump all of your Dragon Fires out before you can hit the reload button. So that is definitely a very specific scenario where this buff, or this um, nerf, hits hard. I just still don't think it's worth it. I mean, I guess on the Griffin. The Griffin, I do like it the more I'm thinking about it because those side-mounted racks are so difficult to utilize. But utilizing them with the Dragonfire, or DEMs in general, but especially the Dragonfire as like a finisher, follow-up to your primary large missile launcher. Yeah. But now they're just a little bit worse. Uh, but yeah, the, the ammo cost is just too low for me to want to use them on Vigilance. So I off, I don't often see those in my fleets. It's just 15 ordnance points, or 12 ordnance points to only get two missiles. It's just rough. That's that's brutal. That's un, that's like, no. No, thank you. Um, some modding notes. Uh, some bug fixes, which I didn't even know were problems. I appreciate. Uh, the main one here is the Neuralink ship is... If your Neuralink ship is disabled, you can now transfer back to your physical location via the Neuralink. I didn't... I've messed around with the Neuralink. I think it's very... It's a very cheeky, fun mechanic two brains or two ships one brain very fun i think it adds a nice flair to like the solo run where it's like yeah i'm i'm playing two ships but it's the same captain to me that's like a yeah you know I'm t it's, it's a nice extension of the solo ship run which i love the solo ship run i need to do another one uh sooner than later and i was planning on doing a duo ship run with the Neuralink. Uh, i'll have to look into doing that sooner than later as well once some of the mods catch up, because I uh, that that's one where I would want to do it in Nexerland, and have like you know start level eight, so I can have the Neuralink online right away, and have a few other skills to make uh make it more exciting, because having to build up to the Neuralink is just no fun. <laughs> uh, they also um, once we get down to the skills, we'll see that that's been shifted down to be more accessible too. Uh, all right, so notes back to January. Uh, hyperspace topography fuel reduce has been buffed, which is nice. Uh, so whenever you're in a slipstream, you you use even less fuel, which is great because uh, when you get into a slipstream, slipstreams used to be like really kind of um, a trap almost because you wouldn't think about the fact that yeah you're going faster, but you're burning fuel equal to the speed, not equal to the distance traveled. So like the speed increase was also increasing your fuel consumption so that 50 percent was essentially just offsetting it so now it's actually fuel like it's even better to get into a slipstream which is nice like slipstreams were a real easy way to end up burning through fuel and not realizing what you're doing as you're crossing the entire map um and an ability to add a gate this is a huge one i know modders have had this for a while but to see in the vanilla game that we can now colonize whatever system we want and put a gate there 
Like, that's exciting. I'm wondering what the mechanics are behind it. If you need, I'm assuming you would need to have completed the storyline first. Um, but it would be nice if it was just something available, even if you hadn't. Uh, it's going to be interesting seeing how that's implemented. That's um, something that I'm going to do in this playthrough uh, that I'm going to do today, is I'm going to focus on colonization, because a lot of what these um, changes are working with the, uh, as you can see over here, the colony crisis tweaks. One of my biggest issues with the uh, with the last patch was that colonies became so much more busy work. It, it just felt like a headache, like it wasn't worth it anymore to colonize in vanilla game. Um, then again, this is me running around with my cheap fleet and not really needing a lot. But now they've changed the uh, colony crisis instead of the hostile activity. Like I'm, I'm really excited to see how that is implemented. So we're gonna, I'm definitely going to rush colonization in this uh, new file that I'm going to open up. Um, and I'm prob, I'm going to still try to be close to the coral worlds. That's always my preference. Uh, but I'm going to find a new system uh, because of something else that's been added, where it's in the later notes. Uh, we'll get to it. But um, the my favorite systems, Penelope and Duzak are now no longer free to colonize. They have been claimed by factions, even though they're unpopulated, which is kind of a huge bummer to me. I I, I used to really push for Duzak especially because it was so low maintenance, and Penelope because it's so there's so many spaces to colonize. Those were almost always my suggestion to new players. Now those, like, being no longer available... I mean, they're still available, and you can actually disable this uh, easily. I'll, I'll talk more about it when I get down there, so let's uh, put that off for now. Uh, made further improvements to help fleets avoid being trapped in black holes when in a non-current location. I, this is like AI pathing, I'm guessing. Uh, there's some other uh, notes further down about this as well. Um, increased AI core payout for a per Saiyan League to 150% rep and 150% credits. This makes sense. Like... Per se in League, the whole idea is that they're not afraid to break the hegemony laws. So why would they only be giving out the random, the, the regular bounties for these AI cores? They probably want to secret them away and use them themselves. It makes sense that they would give a little bit better than the hegemony, they, if only to keep them out of hegemony hands. Because we know, especially if you've been playing some of the newer content, that the hegemony doesn't exactly have a history of not using these things. Um, jailbreak mission no longer has timer on the return stage. Oh, this I'm very happy about. This is, I, I only just now realized what this is. When you jailbreak someone, uh, the return mission used to have like a 60 day timer on it. And I would always forget this after queuing up a whole bunch of missions and end up go taking this prisoner to deep space and be gone for like a couple of months only to realize when the, uh, I failed the mission that, oh, right, there was a timer on that. So I'm really glad that that's no longer the case because it's the only one like that. There's other missions where you retrieve, like, VIPs or um, you, re re you um, especially with the uh, the core story where you ransom a researcher or you go to deliver a researcher or you pick up a researcher. Like, there's a lot of random missions that have a person on your ship, essentially, and they don't have this timer. This is the only one that was like that. So it makes it even easier to forget that there's this requirement. So I'm glad they just got rid of it. It makes it more in line with all of the other missions that are similar. Um, just the music playback in your slipstreams. Uh, I haven't noticed that being an issue. I guess I'll have to keep an ear out for that when we're playing to see if I notice a difference. Sleeper Pather cells no longer show up under colony threats, which this has to do with the way that the missions... Like I oh I think this is just a matter of just like organizing the uh, the different places. Yeah, so like the so this makes it so that like the only only actual threats show up because like sleeper cells are no longer a threat, but they are still there. So I guess it makes uh there's just a little bit of organization that I kind of that you know I appreciate that. Remove mission tag from faction commissions so it doesn't just show up in missions constantly i like that too um waypoint a task with no ships assigned are automatically removed when the ui is closed very happy about this because i am constantly clicking on the map forgetting that it's going to create a new waypoint so i'm glad to see that these that i don't have to worry about meticulously deleting them that they will just close when i close the tab very happy about that 
Uh, I still would rather they're not just, you know, I would like to see that change a bit more, but if I could pick one little thing, that would be a nice one. So that is nice. Uh, Thumper got buffed. It reduces the flux shot to 25 when it was 30. That's, considering how many shots it puts out, that's a significant uh, change. I don't know that it's going to really change the use of the Thumper necessarily, but ships that have them will definitely uh, appreciate that for sure. Like, you know, there's a few ships where I like to throw Thumpers on because uh, the Vigilance especially. It's like it's already a straight craft, so when it, uh, with the way I build them, like, you know, typically doing the Cyclone Reapers. So the f having them moving in to do the Reaper shot, if that doesn't finish it, being able to dump the thumper in after that shot, you're almost always going to hit hull. So it's going to get a ton of damage stacked on top of that strike that it already did. So I'm really, uh, really glad to see that. It's going to buff that a little bit. I'll have to definitely play with that today. Uh, hammer barrage. Oh, oh let's not skip over. Cyclone Reaper's ammo count is reduced. That makes sense. <laughs> there are so many other missiles that have a reduced ammo cost. Uh, and have no, like, real advantage to taking them, unless you're, spe like, with the large missile slot, it always was, like, what what you want to do with that slot, there's not really a lot of choices. Like, if you're going to use the, uh, if you want them to punch shields, there's only one option, that's the one you take. If you want anti-fighters, there's one option, that's what you take. You know, if you want, now, with if you want damage, the Cyclone Reaper is almost always going to be compared to the hammer barrage so to see that the cyclone reaper now has reduced ammo count and a larger refire delay and the hammer barrage is now reduced in op cost this helps differentiate the two a lot and i very much appreciate this um the cyclone reaper even with 14 shots is still exceptionally powerful uh the refire delay will definitely be felt because hammer barrage fires so much quicker and this just widens the gap in their speed and, and usability and the fact that it now has a reduced op cost on the hammer barrage i mean that's a big reduction that's a 20 percent reduction in cost which is fantastic so now the hammer barrage is going to be one of the cheaper options uh, the cheapest option next to probably the pillums i think i don't even remember it's the pillums let's check this real quick does the large pillum have uh what is that large pillum called it's probably under the pillum lrm catapult right okay so that costs 14 points so for only two points more you can get a hammer barrage that's fantastic i appreciate that all right uh plasma cannon had a note about it not automatically firing on fi fighters that's cool I'm not, i wonder if the ai will actually do that themselves um there's a lot of weapons that like i don't think about this at all as much as i probably should like yeah i wouldn't want my plasma cannon just randomly firing out of fighters first of all only the first shot's going to be really accurate but then it's like it's just super overkill there's no way my ship doesn't have something to deal with fighters on it besides the plasma cannon like unless you build a sunder to be like a yolo sunder all plasma cannon even then you, you could put like small swarm racks and you know, pd on it to protect it somewhat like you wouldn't literally just have the plasma cannon anyway um and it sounds like that that was already the case it just didn't have the note Maybe we'll see in the lower patch notes that that was something that was changed recently. Um, switch to using a different garbage collector and init uh, increase initial and max perm gen space to 192 meters. Meters? I don't know what me me uh, measurement that is. Um, these together, uh, I don't know what they mean specifically, but it's this last line. Both of these may improve the performance in heavily modded games. So it sounds like they've changed some of the base... Uh, functions of the way the game handles um, code to make it a lot more stable as you add more and more mods. This is something that you know heavy modders definitely noticed was that uh, the memory leak issues, where you know you get that thing and it would scream memory leak and you would noticeably have issues with the performance in the game and you'd have to literally restart your game sometimes. Or if you had a big enough system, you could just tank it and move on and keep playing, which is 
thanks to my recent upgrade to my PC, that's what I would just do. <laughs> but hopefully this will allow that to um, not be as much of an issue. Um, bunch of stuff for the modding. I'm not familiar with this. A lot of it has to do with you know JavaScript stuff. Uh, personal bounty targets now have the rank of captain or admiral. Previously all were lieutenant. I wonder how that's going to... I'm guessing that's going to change their skills. Does that mean they're like level 6 or 7? I'll have to look at that. Fix issue causing warning beacon ITEL item to show the wrong star system sometimes. Oh, that's good to fix. Uh, increases hazard rating due to volatile shortage. Now properly increases upkeep. Interesting. I did not notice that. I almost never use these on my own colonies, though. These are all almost exclusively for setting up scam operations on... Uh, the colonies and the core worlds. Um, fix issue that caused transfer command to stop working if the ship the player was in retreated via being disabled while having phase anchor. Huh. Working if the player ship the player was in retreated. Okay. So transfer command will stop working if the ship the player was in. So the ship you're leaving was blasted with, while having phase anchor. That's a pretty niche situation to come up. I'm surprised I haven't noticed that myself because I often uh, use phase anchor and use the um, harbinger. Uh, but then again, I typically do this after it's already destroyed. I don't tend to retreat it before it pops because with phase anchor, there's no reason to. You just drive that thing into the ground and then it bounces out. Like, the idea of retreating it manually when it has phase anchor seems like a waste of time. I mean, yeah, you'll you know be able to recover it with a little bit more combat readiness and uh, less damage, but why? Like the whole point is to have that scary ship in the field. Anyway, all right. So the big meaty section now. And there's a lot here. This is the uh, this is the the bulk of the changes. And uh, I'm excited for a lot of them. Uh, so, reworked hostile activity as colony crisis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up that whole page. Because there's quite a bit in here. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a rework. I should have read this beforehand, but let's read it now. Uh, taking the lessons from how existing mechanics work. Adding a lot of content. Yeah, this is why the, the patch is changed to being uh, 90, uh, 0.97 instead of being 0. 6, uh, 0. 0.96.1. Like, they decided that because of all the stuff they're adding, and you can see there's a huge section here, that it was worth it. Uh, more variety. For a quick recap. Establish a colony and get hostile activity. Yeah, I know. I'm familiar with that part. Uh, I feel like they have to keep the level down to avoid penalties, which both creates busy work for them. And this is this was my number one complaint, and in turn makes them avoid the more interesting events that occur when the activity level maxes out. Yeah, that's almost always the option. Is I'm not interested. Uh, it's interesting to me because objectively speaking, you can absolutely ignore the current activity level if your colony is set up. It's just a modest reduction in profits, but psychologically, the amount of incentive to keep it down is enough that players, uh, plenty of players, feel like they have to do it. Yeah, I mean that's. Like, I, I don't know, what, like, how much, like, how, like, the, the main thing here is that people play this game in so many different ways, and for me, a colony is something that I usually make for free storage. It's free storage and, and production at the cheapest cost. So, I'll typically only have one, maybe two colonies where I'm harvesting, like, I'll take a gas giant and a dead moon because I want to be able to get the source of volatiles, uh, which is a large stockpile of volatiles I can draw from at cheap co at cheap prices because the base price is actually some of the, like, that you get from drawing from your colony is actually some of the better prices you can get um, unless you're hoarding from all the pirates, but that's not going to be enough if you get an orbital lamp online on somebody else's colony, like you're going to need a bigger stockpile and a consist consistent one too. Uh, and then the dead moon for um, setting up the uh, orbital works 
to be able to make custom production because it's just so much more useful than running around the sector trying to buy stuff. It's just, I'm just going to produce it at home. And it's also great to have that source of supplies and gas as well. And, but usually the way station alone stockpiles enough of that for you. But having the production on top of that is really nice. Um, so for me, because I only have two small colonies or sometimes just one colony, having to deal with the hostile activity was always a chore at every level because it's part of having those colonies is that I don't want them to be money sinks. If anything, I want their passive income to actually help offset my fleet costs. And it was just so annoying seeing all those penalties, all the, you know, the pirate. It seemed like pirate activity was massively increased and the Ludic Path activity as well. It did not seem to me like it was simply uh, something that could easily be ignored or something that's like, I don't have to do it. It was quite the exact opposite. Even when I prefer low maintenance, I felt like I would have to engage in this stuff, especially at the rate that it would build up and stuff would happen because my colonies tended to become very profitable very quickly, even though I wasn't doing huge profit-focused colonies. It was just the fact that they were prospering and it was enough to build up uh, over time. And this is after taking, like, figuring out that you can essentially bribe the pirates to leave you alone. It's like, that deal by itself was is only good if the pirates then also were to help me get rid of the Ludic Path. Like, it, it's just so frustrating. So I'm really excited to see how things have changed because I really feel like this mentality, the, the dev mentality... And I want to say, yes, this is Alex. Uh, not to speak, I'm not speaking ill of them. I'm just saying that their play style is clearly very different than mine if they feel like they can just ignore this and that that was supposed to be like the thing. Because uh, I had the exact opposite experience. To me, it was very imposing. Even when they tweaked it down, I did not like it. So we'll have to see how it changes. But in general, I have always sung praises over the whole idea of it because of the stuff that it allowed in the game like having a whole new section of content and that is literally what this patch is is every is that culminating in this big huge update of a lot of new new content dealing with that system so i'm excited to see how that plans out um taking a step back why are the penalties there i don't need to hear your justifications <laughs> uh Reframing as crisis mechanic wise, though, I think it'd work better without the penalties. The incentives line up better. So, rebranding hostile activity as colony crisis, which doesn't sound like something that should have penalties until an actual crisis happens. And along with this, removing all the along the way penalties. So, yeah, okay, so this is something that's much better for me. It's like most of the time I would be ignoring it anyway until it builds up to a point where I had to deal with it as much as possible. Uh, because a lot of the ways to mitigate it along the way just weren't viable. Um, so the, the, the big thing for me is like seeing that those penalties are getting taken away means it definitely is something that I can, instead of having to stress over, I can just mark it on the agenda like I need to take care of this. It's coming up. Uh, so the way it works is you've got a progress bar, fills up ground, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the same. Uh... Hostile fleet still spawning your systems before that point, depending on the types of attention you're attracting. Uh, and you still have some reason to fight these fleets. First off, combat can be profitable on its own. Second, you can juice it up by building a commerce industry and having a permanent independent bounty in the system. Yeah, that was something I hadn't really explored um, because I tend not to build commerce, but now it's like, it might be an even... like Commerce is usually like a capstone industry where I put it at the end when there's nothing else that I need to build, because again, I, my colonies are for utilitarian needs more than just pure profit on their own, because on a lot of times I can make more money by you know, taking advantage of their stockpile of resources. Like if I have a whole bunch of drugs stockpiling or a whole bunch of weapons stockpiling or a whole bunch of just supplies and gas, like being able to move that to when a someone has a huge demand, being able to fulfill that demand on demand whenever 
is uh, is well worth it, and I can make enough money to offset any of the costs. So I'm like, so having those colonies be utilitarian like that, I don't tend to build commerce at all, and usually not until the very end. So it's good to so like now that I'm thinking about it, there might be. But the thing is, though, is I don't want to, the whole, the whole thing is I don't want to play Bounty Hunter in my system. I don't want to have to be swatting away fleets. Like, this is the whole reason why I build patrol bases, why I have these, you know, investments in my colonies for defenses, is to take care of this stuff. So the, the idea that I then have to go play Bounty Hunter in my own fleet, or my own system, it's like, what am I paying all these patrols to do? Like, come on. Um, so, now if you don't really like the upcoming crisis, you can fight hostile fleets, reduce event progress, I don't, like, to me that doesn't seem like it's worth it. Maybe if they've buffed it recently, maybe, but, uh, I have yet to see chasing down fleets as a viable way to quickly deal with this. It always seemed to me like the, the offset was way too small. Uh, I don't know, I guess maybe they've changed it. We'll see. We'll see as we get into the game. Uh, important thing to think about Crisis is they're no longer just a mess of bad thing that happens and you need to stop it from making your colony. They're definitely still that, but they also come with opportunities. There's a carrot to go with the stick. For example, fighting off a pirate raid will give your colonies a piracy respite uh, condition that increases their accessibility, and fighting off a Lytic path attack will disrupt pather cells across the entire sector for a long time. Okay. Hmm. I mean, we'll have to see exactly how that plays out. Uh, the given that a crisis is, if you see the light of law, potentially a good thing, the player might feel like they don't want to fight the hostile fleets. So like, I mean, like, I already didn't do this. <laughs> Defense abilities of your colonies slow down event progress, including reducing it by a flat amount. Otherwise, you can end up with negative event progress and miss out on a crisis opportunities entirely. All right, whatever. Uh, after a crisis happens, event progress is reset to a random value within a pretty wide range. The idea is this is to make the pacing of the crisis more unpredictable, which, great. That's not what I want, but hey. Uh, you might get several crises close together, even so much so... Even so much so that one is still going on while another is happening, but handling... Uh, handing them through the main colony crisis event makes sure you had the heads up. Right, so for me, this just sounds like a nightmare. This, this sounds like I don't want to colonize anymore. <laughs> like, I, I already... like the, the thing is, like... I firmly believe that colonization is best suited to endgame. Like, you already did a lot of stuff in your play, and it's now, like, the endgame content, essentially. So for that, and that kind of an idea, like, this is essentially, like, more content to engage in in the endgame. Great. But if you're doing colonization early and having to deal with all this while also exploring, while also doing a bunch of other stuff, and doing story missions and leveling up, like, this, this sounds like they've expanded hostile activities to be more busy work, not less. But again, we'll see once we get in there. I am happy to see that it's been updated and there's more content in it. But, uh, alright, so in addition to the pirate, speaking of new content, to the pirate and Ludic path crisis, there are now also crises from all the major factions, except the independents. And one for having a redacted base in your system. No longer will that be just a free source of defenders to thin out oncoming raiders. Um, okay. Punitive expedition or punitive expeditions, except for the you put a colony in the faction system ones, have been replaced with the crisis, which are more elaborate, customized versions to suit the character of each faction. Some of these went quite a bit further than I was originally expecting. The rest is going to have spoilers about the new content, so I'm going to skip all this, but it is all here. Uh, just looking at it quickly, the hegemony seems like the AI inspections are not going to be a crisis. Um, you know what, heck, I'll just skim through it real quick. Uh, pirates and Lenic Path, uh, if you defeat a pirate raider path or attack, they won't come after you this way again. To me, this feels refreshing. Okay. Uh, the system finally has enough content and doesn't 
need to keep throwing the same thing at the players over and over. As a bonus, ending the pirate slash smasher thread adds the opportunity that these uh, present. Of course, if you don't defeat the raid, it'll keep happening periodically. Uh, but you might ask, where does this leave the original narrative resolution to these problems? Namely, making you uh, blah blah. Uh, you defeat one, but eventually another would come, given those were only two sources of activity time. That made sense. Okay, so it's just going to be, there's going to be less of a focus on always having pirates in Bloodic Path as a crisis. Okay, so it's going to be varied up a bit more, without getting too deep into the woods of the spoilers. It's going to be, like, I'm, I'm interested in that. That seems like it's going to be nice. Uh, the League ended up being one of my more involved ones. The original I was just built on a punitive expedition a bit, dress it up with some narrative resolutions, and call it a day, blah, blah, blah. Uh, don't want to spoil too much. That's nice. Uh, so let's just say that while combat is very much an option, the League's approach is not fundamentally hostile, even if it is heavy-handed. And there'll be options to dealing with it, including the political ones of a shady backroom deal sort. And some of the benefits provided the player operating uh, on the same plane. And some of the benefits provided to the player operating on the same plane. Uh, uh, huh. Not sure exactly. I mean, that's that'll just have to be something we'll have to explore in-game. But it does sound like that these uh, extra ones... Are uh, uh, yeah, okay. So instead of having like random stuff being randomly like sending hostile fleets to your bases because uh, all of a sudden you're dealing too much rock, it's like we want all the dirt rocks, you deal in dirt rocks, we have to now smash your dirt rocks, you know, stuff like that. Uh, now it's going to be faction specific, which I'm wondering if they got rid of those hostile fleets completely, or if uh, they're just going to be more rare, or if they're going to continue to happen alongside all of this. But, yeah, the AI inspection are now a series of escalating crises instead of being separate from this system. Defeating the inspection is narratively framed as defeating the hegemony, and there's a new way to avoid the inspections. That's cool. I'm happy to see there's a new way to avoid the inspections. Alright, but I don't so we have over here in the patch notes, uh, no penalties, just risk reward opportunities when a crisis happens. I'm not sure that's properly explained. So it's no penalties as it scales up, but I mean, there's still the penalty of getting attacked. Uh, but I am happy about that because one of my biggest issues with the crisis system was like the, the, the debuffs on your colonies. Like I'm glad to see that getting changed. Uh, punitive expeditions and inspection rolled into the crisis system. So your punitive expeditions are the ones I was talking about. Um, colony and faction space. Yeah, that one's different. Uh, then, like, that's going to be... I mean, I, mean I, I don't tend to colonize in faction space unless I have the commission and approval. So I'm not sure what that ends up playing out like. But I guess uh, maybe we'll have to experiment and see how that works. Maybe we still colonize Duzok and deal with the hegemony. Uh, added crisis, or oh, sorry, AI inspection bribe amounts increase very substantially. I didn't even realize you could bribe them. <laughs> it shows how much I know about the game. Added crisis for all the different factions with narrative resolutions and agreements and the, the fleets you encounter your system to any crisis, blah, blah. Uh, base colony stability is back to five. Space force and megaport accessibility accessibility back to 50 to 80. I didn't realize those had changed. Uh, a lot of path cells can once again cause incidents at player colonies. That makes sense. Not the way they change things. Uh, pirate bases can once again afflict player colonies with pirate activity. But if you deal with the station station king, cancels this out. Um, deal with the station king no longer reduces event progress every month. Uh, I never really found this as being that big of a deal because it doesn't actually, like, I forget exactly the problem I was coming across. I, but I think that would have to do mostly with the fact that because of the way hostile activity was set up, even though I had a deal with the Station King, it didn't really solve the problem because the Pather cells were still an issue. The Pather 
the hostile activity was still rising. So, like, I think all these changes are, it sounds like, reading it over here in the notes compared to reading the, the blog post does make it sound like it's being tweaked more towards what I would like to see. Which is, I know, obviously I'm happy about that. But we'll see once we actually get into the game. Because I'm going to be rushing colonization. So we can see how that works. Um, and a new abilities. Reverse polarity. Okay, so here's some of the cool stuff that I'm really excited to see. Revulse polarity reverses the direction of slipstream travel. It's auto-assigned as a hyperspace alternative to scavenge. Uh, what, the, what they've done is um, ability slots can now be set up to switch between different abilities when in hyperspace. Uh, which is really cool. I'm very happy with that because you can't scavenge in hyperspace at all. So having something change into that slot is really nice. Although uh, the distress call, again, that's another one where it's like it's not you don't use that in hyperspace. So having that auto assign as well is, is really nice. Uh, but I don't usually even have the distress call on my bar. It's usually on a backup bar since I use it so rarely. Um, but that's going to now have generate slip surge. Which, again, since I'm, I don't know how often I'm going to use that, so maybe it's going to be fine having it on the distress call. But that creates a high-velocity slipstream away from a nearby gravity well, but it requires a fat star, a neutron star, or a black hole. I wonder if a trinary system, like, if a trinary system is just three smaller stars, I feel like that should count still. But... Well, the, that's the one I definitely want to explore. I'm wondering where you get these new abilities. If it's from the hyperspace topography, uh, learning that, or if it um, has to do with a skill. But we'll see as we get down to the skills and related stuff, there's some new skills that have been retro, that have been changed around. And that's over here, too. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Starscape sector map now shows slipstreams. I didn't realize it didn't. Uh, fleets will use emergency burn to better deal with black holes, slipstreams, and hyperspace storm strikes. Uh, this is AI fleets. I'm guessing when you have your fleet on autopilot, I'm not sure if that will or won't. I'm probably, I'm guessing it won't, because when you autopilot, you don't use skills. But to see that the AI fleets will have a better time of dealing with these is, is good. Uh, fleets much more careful about avoiding black holes in the first place. Also good. Because, like, anytime I see an enemy, uh, an enemy, uh, a random fleet sucked in a black hole, I feel bad because it's entirely, entirely to do with the AI pathing. I mean, I'm sure anyone who's ever used the automatic pathing has gotten a free tan before. So it's, you know, same issue with black holes. You know, these AI pilots just want to fly over everything dangerous. So it's good to see that they'll be avoiding those a little bit better now. Maybe it makes colonizing a black hole system kind of more viable, even. Just because now you don't have to worry about fleets getting sucked away. <laughs> uh, here's another big one. The Orion Perseus uh, Abyss in the lower left of the sector is now more than just a label. This is the thing that's really exciting me and why I'm really glad I didn't put out that video. <laughs> because now we have a whole new exploration target. Um, this will technically work in existing saves, but it has some side effects, uh, like having star systems in the abyssal areas, so starting a new save is recommended. So, like, there's a few faction mods that add stuff to that area, and you're going to want to definitely not <laughs> be using that already, and it will, may, like, that faction probably may need a, a bit of an update before being able to play in this new patch more than more than some of the others. So the new patch, a lot of times you can just change the version history in the uh, the patch file in the mod file, and it would be okay to just fly with it. Like I know, like a lot of the um, various uh, quality of life mods, you can just do that with, and they'll still work depending on what part of the game they impact. Uh, but for this situation, if like. I don't know how it would work if it would, like, the faction might override placement of game elements and you end up erasing <laughs> the new content with the faction pack. So I'm, I'm planning on just playing vanilla, and uh, I always suggest that, you know, if you're going to go play the new patch, why not just at least start a game in vanilla? But again, this is my play style versus other people's play style. I'm happy just playing for one evening. Like, we're going to be probably going for, like, six seven eight hours tonight and i might not return to that game again like I, I might just next time i stream start up a whole new file i've 
typically don't return to games because um, unless they're like really large modded games where I was already intending on doing multiple plays. I do very short plays most of the time, and I also tend to have shorter term goals. So for me, uh, like because I play sh uh, um, shorter like that, I had a point, and now I've forgotten it. It just fell out of my head as I was staring at the screen. Um, geez, what was it that I was trying to get to? There's a reason why I was outlining that I play shorter versus playing longer. Oh, it's because, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not scared of just restarting a new file. That doesn't ever bother me. In fact, I usually enjoy having that opportunity to restart and do things differently and see how things will play out. Uh, in fact, one of the series that I want to do for um, streams is doing more role-play-focused plays, which I was doing forever ago as well. And there's still a few videos on my YouTube about that um and that's typically how i play is i like doing one session maybe returning and doing a second session but very rarely do i play uh, a single file for the long term anymore um oh we are dropping frames is it okay a little bit of a spike or a dip but everything seems to be leveling out now Okay, um, added a new handmade star system in the Abyss, This that being the Orion Persean Abyss. Uh, uh, added Rogue Planets to the Abyss. I'm interested to see, I think that's similar to the um, the Black Sight. I forget what the Black Sight is called. I think it's just called the Black Sight. Uh, but the, um, but I, I, I love the whole Rogue Planets thing. I wish they would litter some more of those throughout the system as like little things to find. I think that would be a very cool thing to do. I mean, we already have the nebula. Why not extend that further and have, like, just straight-up rogue planets? I think that would be very interesting. Uh, but seeing that this... Uh, it's like... I, I, I'm probably going to end up shooting over. What I'll probably do is I'll do an um, exploration setup. Play, like, really quickly build up some starting resources. And then... Um, Go out into deep space, find colony items to figure out, and then maybe find a system as well, because I want to colonize outside of, of the uh, the core worlds, since a lot of the changes <coughs> make that the more viable option anyway. So we'll find a place to colonize and get some colony items, figure out what we're going to do, and go from there. Uh, so I probably won't explore the abyss until after a couple of hours of exploring and collecting things. Uh, new type of sensor ghost. I'm excited to see what that's about, because uh, the sensor ghosts I've gotten to the point where I identify them pretty quickly. So having a new one is going to be interesting. Uh, hyperspace topography. Now I get a few points for scanning magnetic fields, which is a nice one because that magnetic fields show up on a lot of different planets. So uh, now it's just something else to think about besides the gas giants. I often forget to scan um, binary and trinary systems. So this will, in general, like. Having more targets to scan is nice. I, I, I'm guessing the hyperspace topography is going to be expanded on further. We'll have to see how this new mod adds stuff into it. Like, I'm wondering if that's how you get the new skills is through the hyperspace topography event. Um, S mods on ships are now counted for auto resolve. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means. I'm guessing that's with outfitting. Not sure what that means. Oh, auto-resolve in the campaign. Okay, so it hadn't been counting S-mods for auto-resolving conflicts. That's... <laughs> that seems... Okay, I'm really glad they fixed that. I guess that would explain why some of my fleets sometimes... It's like, man, this fight's stupid easy. And it's because I'm playing with progressive S-mods and have five S-mods that aren't being accounted for in a conflict. So this will that's nice to know that, no, I'm not crazy. Yes, my fleets were stronger and not getting calculated based on that. All right, cool. So S-Mods are now going to actually buff your ship when it comes for auto-resolve. Nice to know. 
Uh, trying to use cargo items with the right-click action during a transaction will now indicate that you need to complete the current transaction first instead of quietly doing nothing. Uh, this is something that I come across a lot when I'm like looting because this is not just for trans like transactions also mean salvaging stuff. It's anytime you enter that inventory transferring screen. If you are in the middle of a transaction, a transfer of any kind, you can't right-click on pads like the data, uh, like recipes and stuff to use them. Uh, it would just do nothing. Now at least it will tell you that it's doing nothing. So you're not just sitting there clicking on it trying to figure out why. Which I, that's definitely going to be helpful for newer players. But it'll also help remind me, oh right, I got to finish transferring or learn. What I tend to do is I just right click everything before I start transferring stuff. Uh, but there's often the times when I'm trying to do it in between and it'll be nice to have that. I'm, I'm actually curious what that's going to look like, if it'll be a full-on pop-up that I have to click a button for, or if it'll just make a noise. I'm, I'm interested to see how that works. Uh, reduce story point cost to create a stable location. Very happy about this. They de this is another one of those buffs where it's like colonization and, and uh, on random systems has been really buffed because this was always an issue for me. It's like I had to spend five points to get another stable location is brutal. Uh, so having to only spend two is really nice. Like definitely makes uh, a lot more systems more viable, especially earlier on. Uh, make dead drop missions uh, complications have a lower reputation impact. Okay, so when you get into a fight with someone trying to interrupt your mission, you get lower reputation. I mean that that makes sense because they're the ones quite that are engaging you. So, like, there's a lot of situations where this will come up where it's like you're forced into a fight with another faction, and even if it doesn't cause you to go to war with that other faction, it's annoying to lose reputation for a fight that you didn't start. It's like, I, I it's not my fault that you want to fight me, Ludic Church, because I'm delivering some ancient evil artifact to... <coughs> Excuse me. That I'm delivering, you know, some sort of something you don't want me to deliver. But if you start the fight, I shouldn't take as big of a, of a rep drop. So I'm glad to see that that's going to be the case. Uh, take all button no longer takes over capacity of fuel. Very happy about this. This has been a blight to me with the way I uh, explore. Oh, and I am very happy to see that this, this has been changed. I often have like have problems with being overburdened with fuel specifically because I'm using take all so very happy to see that change that's that's much needed very glad uh, now here's the sad part <laughs> here's a, here's a big sad part Penelope star is now claimed by the Ludic church and Duzok and Tia Taxit uh, by the hegemony for uh, this is for the purpose of player colonies getting expeditions sent against them but it can be turned off in the file. Just look for this uh, heading. And I'm guessing it probably has a true false next to it. You just change that. Um, this is big because I used to always suggest to new players that Penelope was one of the easiest to start colonization because it has a lot of planets that you can utilize. Especially if um, the desert world has farmland, then it's a really good... Penelope star system and it's really fun to, to have a big system in the core worlds so that is basically shut down now unless you want to go to war with the church or if you become allies with the church uh, might be something to look into now that I'm thinking about it having a commission with a lot of church just so I can colonize Penelope might be a thing uh, but now that Duzok is claimed by the hegemony oh that's really depressing because Duzok was my favorite Getting a hold of a um, of a big suckatron to, uh, for the gas giant to suck up extra volatiles that I could sell to whoever I scammed with the orbital lamp, like that was my bread and butter. And now, oh, I'm depressed. Like that's that's a problem. Like not being able to colonize Duzok. I don't know how I'm gonna how I'm gonna deal with that. I may end up actually turning that off. <laughs> I don't like to turn things off like that, but I don't know. Uh, it's definitely going to mean that uh, I'm going to be pickier about what maps 
I play if I'm planning on doing colonization. Uh, you almost can be commissioned just by visiting the shrines. Interesting. Thank you, Rise, uh, for that. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. You do get reputation from visiting the shrines, plus you can make donations and deliver supplies. It shouldn't be too difficult to get a lot of church commission. So perhaps that would that is still what I would suggest to new players because it's consistent. And that's the main thing with the suggestions that I tend to make to new players is I'm aiming for consistency across a variety of play styles. And Penelope suits so many needs. So perhaps joining the Letic Church so that you can colonize Penelope is probably the still consistent, easy option. And the reality is, is like, you can get a hegemony condition really easy if you do the vanilla start anyway. So if I, and when I go out into deep space, I do so with a hegemony commission to offset all of the costs of my fleet, you know, the crew costs. And then I, now it's just a matter of like, I just keep that and just keep playing. But it means I have to side with the hegemony, which I, in a vanilla game, I really dislike doing that because they are very clearly <laughs> the just boring big faction and I don't enjoy playing alongside them but when you start adding modded factions the hegemony gets checked a lot more and uh, some of those modded factions are designed to be the big bad guy so maybe in a, uh, a modded playthrough I'll look into doing like a hegemony specific playthrough would be kind of interesting because like Especially if I include the Hivers. That was what I wanted to do. When I, after, um, I want to do a review of all the different modded factions and then put a bunch of them together and do a Hiver play. Where I'm, you know, fighting the Hivers but not allying with anyone specifically. Maybe this time, maybe instead I'll, ha I'll uh, ally with the Hegemony just so I can get Duzak. I don't know what I'm going to do with that playthrough in general, but it is something to consider that you could just get the hegemony commission you could just get the Letic church commission um the lieutenant from the tutorial will greet the player appropriately based on if they've met or not i always thought this was funny uh that if you don't do the tutorial there is this guy you will bump into in the hegemony bar that will talk about stuff that you didn't do uh i also i i'm not sure how i feel about it though because now it's like that essentially means this person is kind of like still going to be available as a commission i mean as a um, contact it's kind of like the uh the newbie contact it's like you're going to get this as a contact as long as you talk to them and uh it just seems like it's a, uh, a beginner thing so now i feel like it should be if that's the intent it should probably just be someone in your contacts already or like maybe a mission or something to draw newer players to it. But if you've already done the tutorial and now you're launching without the tutorial, like you don't really need that guidance. So I don't know. I, I'll be interested to see how that, I'll, I'll go looking for that when we are doing our playthrough and see how it's been changed. Uh, during at the gates, NPC fleets no longer block redacted during the second last mission stage. I don't even remember which one that is. Uh, <laughs> Fleets unique to various missions no longer retain important icon after the mission interaction. I didn't realize that was a problem. Um, I may actually, I think that was something I came across when doing the uh, the the, the, Syndic, the Sindrian missions. But anyway, uh, clarified certain interactions with a fleet for certain cases during the during end of the usurpers. That's the exact one I was talking about. So I, I am at some point going to go through that mission for this playthrough. Is this is it just might not be something I get to tonight. But it does uh create a reason for me to come back and play more after tonight. Um fleets unique to various missions blah, 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 can now engage contest at a certain point during the GA mission chain where it previously was not possible. I'm guessing that's the regular story, what's GA short for? Huh. I know there's a point in the during the missions where you go to Contest Den. So I'm glad to have that option available. Uh, AI Koros on redacted ships may now sometimes have point defense skill depending on the loadout. That's cute. 
Um, increases the amount of fuel available for purchase at colonies by 50%. That's nice. As it, it could be a struggle sometimes to make sure you had the right amount of fuel. Especially, I, I, this helps newer players. Because I have, um, you know, there's, there's certain place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glacial Academy for AI, for GA. Thank you, Rise. That is what it means. I mean, that's the way I ex expected it. Like, you know, the I just think of that as the main quest. So, yeah. So, and I think I'm thinking of exactly the right point. Like, I, I know what they're talking about now. I don't want to get into it for spoilers reasons, but that is, I'm glad that's there. Because um, it's, it's nice to have a variety of ways to resolve the various story missions, especially considering so many of them uh, amount to simply being fetch quests. It's like, did you bring enough marines and or ships? Okay, <laughs> done. <laughs> um, but yeah, increasing the amount of fuel available for purchase of colonies, that'll definitely help out newer players. Uh, it will help me out too, because I will often be running on low fuel when I'm in system, because I know that around the corner I can just grab a bunch of gas from a random colony as long as they're not short. And so having more gas available there, especially in uh, the black market where it's duty-free, because no one wants duty in their fuel. Uh, yeah, having that be a bigger number is going to be nice as well. Um, officers found in sleeping pods. All of the level 7 ones and some of the level 5 ones now use preset skill selections. Alright, so it doesn't go into detail here, but this little string right here makes me very happy. Because quite often, now on the downside, it's going to mean that my that perhaps one of those preset selections aren't going to be the loadout that I would want. But it drove me crazy the amount of times I would find an officer who would be level seven, and they would have both ballistic and energy specialization. It's like there's not a single ship in the entire vanilla game that will utilize both of those without being specifically built for it, and it will not be as strong as if they just had one or the other drives me crazy so it's good to see that uh i'm, I'm assuming that this is going to mean that there's going to be like actual viable skill sets and i would be interested to see what all those actually are i'm kind of bummed that there's not like a list <laughs> that's here but there'll probably be a list in the uh, files somewhere that i could dig up at some point um but yeah i'm just it's going to make the, le the level seven officers more viable because quite often it was a matter of like, oh great, I got one. Let's see what this scratch off lottery ticket has. And you look at their skills and there's a dumpster fire. And it's like, all right, well, so much for that level seven officer. Not worth it in the slightest. I still wish there was some in-game way in vanilla to get a level five officer up. Like you could pick a second in command, essentially. Like an actual second in command. And then have that officer become level seven. And then maybe once they're level 7, you can get another officer at level 6. Like, have, like, a little officer hierarchy. So you could, like, dictate which officers get the chance to level up. I don't know. I just feel like there's there's more that the vanilla game could do with officers that is just not being implemented. Uh, demand filled through player trade stays filled longer. Was 30 days, now 120 days. That is a huge bummer. Oh, crap. Oh, that line. That one right there. Let me let me just scroll in real quick. This line, demand filled through player trade stays filled longer. That is a massive nerf to trade. Because it used to be, like, like that cuts back on the scam for the orbital lamp. That cuts back on a lot of stuff that you could do, because I, you know, it used to be very viable to raid a colony, destroy their spaceport, not destroy it, but take it down, and then swing back once they forgot about it, and then just sell them supplies for the next two or three months that this that the station that the starport's down. Now you only get one tip, or one one payout from doing that. That's a huge nerf. It also nerfs the scam lamp because when you give them the volatiles that they need, it's going to be a long time before the, that demand comes back. Honestly, this is a long time coming. I can't even be mad. Um, this is one of the reasons why... Uh, and then the second one too, black market trade can now fill demand. This is on top of the original nerf, another big nerf. Because now if you do the black market trade to try and get around this first part, it's not going to 
it, it's still going to meet the demand. I always thought it was dumb that black market trade didn't meet the demand because that's literally what the black market is for. When the main market doesn't meet the actual demand for whatever reason, the black market rises up to, to meet that demand. That's literally what a black market is. Uh, like that's the reason why black markets are always around and always like they're all there's always a demand for the black market to meet it's just a matter of how much demand it, are the laws going to allow for the black market uh it just nerfs trading so much i love playing pirate smuggler yeah oh yeah if you if you're primary trading this is a huge nerf but the thing is and i ha i have to admit this was, like I said, a long time coming. This is actually fair. This is the update. Like this, these two lines right here are something that had been missing in the balance of trading, because uh, with these two updates, trading is still very viable, but it's no longer as simple and stupid easy as it once was. Because it, it used to be so easy to abuse the market. Um, I'm very happy, like I said, to see the black market trade is not going to fill demand. Um, but at the same time, it's like... Yeah, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this affects the early game especially. So I am definitely going to try and do my typical early start of focusing on trade and then going to exploration. I don't think it will be... Like I said, it, it, anyone who's really good at trading will understand how this you know hurts, but also understand how it really doesn't. Because some of the most profitable trading you can do doesn't see you abusing these two things anyway. Some of the most profitable trading you do is usually a one-and-done visit someplace, and then you're too busy going off doing other things, uh, or you've already set up like consistent profitable trades like it, it's gonna definitely hurt casual trading more than um professional like focused trading uh but all around i don't feel like it's that big of, like i said it's just essentially it closes a lot of exploits that needed to be closed anyway but yeah ugh all right, so substantially increased out of combat hull repair rates for ships larger than frigates. Happy to see this. Uh, it also means that there's a reduced supply cost because they, they spend less time in repair. Happy to see that as well. Um, out of combat hull repair rates is actually a sneaky way uh, that you burn through supplies when exploring in exploration because every time you get hit by a hyperspace storm or get toasted by a star or sucked off by a black hole, um, this is where a lot of those numbers end up going um because like if you're if you get damaged in a hyperspace storm and it's one of your more expensive ships that could be a lot especially if they have a slow repair rate uh, this is really nice i'm wondering if like how much how this like stacking this with um field repairs is going to make re-engaging with larger fleets a lot more viable as well this is a good this is a good buff. I'm happy to see this. Uh frigates already repaired faster, so they didn't need it, but it's just nice to see um the larger ships getting a little bit of love. Because you know, a lot of people tend to play with larger fleets. So happy for them to get that. Uh arms dealer found in bar significantly improve inventory and volume, always at least medium importance if they become a contact. Good to hear. Uh <coughs> I mean I'm not against the low value arms dealer yeah arms dealer selling paragon and astrals i mean we'll see um i actually really liked when the last update added these the lower level arms dealer the that only had like a hundred thousand uh max that they could do and they only sold like usually just weapons or sometimes a few ships or fighters i, I kind of liked that uh, because it made them more plentiful. They have been, like, I have been seeing them a lot more. Um, so I'm interested to see what this improved inventory ends up being. Like, well, instead of seeing, like, uh, oh, they only have small missiles, maybe they'll have small and medium missiles available, or maybe they'll just have all the small weapons available. Like, 
I'm excited to see how that actually changes. We'll have to, I'll have to keep an eye out for arm stealers. I usually always check them anyway, but now I'm really interested to see how this actually improves. Uh, drastically improved effectiveness of introducing false readings into sensor arrays for drawing off patrols to be able to complete self acquired missions. Okay. That's cool. Because this was always something that's like... I mean, I have my own ways for, for dealing with this because I tend to run a small fleet that has a very low sensor profile. So I've never really had much of an issue with these kind of missions. I also just don't tend to take them. But... Um, considering the dangers of trying to introduce these false readings anyway, like sometimes that can be just as difficult as sneaking into the place you're trying to sneak into if they've got a patrol around. Uh, seeing that buffed is nice. Uh, we'll have to, I'll have to play around with that and see it in action. Uh, Glacier Academy Pro Package Retrieval Mission. Add a description of where the probe will be found. Excluded certain terrain, system-wide nebula, and very large ring systems from lists of possible locations. Okay, um, I guess this is the one, the random one. Because when I saw Probe Retrieval, I immediately thought of the introduction mission. But no, this is for when they send you out to retrieve a probe as one of their random missions. So this is nice, because, like, the system-wide nebulas and the, the large ring systems, that would create, like, a lot of place to explore and could complicate actually interacting. All right, I just saw the next line and I'm well distracted. Um, anyway, I'm happy to see this because it's going to make these missions a lot easier to complete. Derelict Mothership now always drops one of Pristine Nanoforge, Synchrotron, or Catalytic Core. Oh boy. Very happy for this. I was literally just in a fight yesterday. Not yesterday, but the last stream I did. Uh... The one before that, actually, because the last stream I did was all early game. But my long, the last long exploration I did, where I got into, I think, at least one derelict mothership fight, and got like a corrupt nano forge. It's like I've already got six of these in my inventory <laughs> from doing all the exploration. I didn't need another one from this. To see, the, like, this is very nice. So this means go, the derelict mothership is now a massive priority for exploration gameplay. Because So you absolutely want to make sure that you can take on that fight, um, which ch which changes up some of my video, because I'm going to have to now like keep in mind that like you're going to want to find as many of these as you can. They are going to be high priority, because even one of these vastly changes. I mean, it's, it's all, the funny thing is all three of them are utilized on the same, uh, the same planet. Like, they all require... Well, these two require no vacuum. This one, you just don't want to put on a habitable planet. So, uh, all of them tend to end up getting utilized on the same sort of de uh, dead moons. You know, no atmosphere. Little tiny, uh, so they have low ac or higher access. Um, but just knowing which industry you're going to want to start out with based on what you get. Uh, obviously... The Pristine Nano Forge is the best option. Like that's that's still the better drop because it can be utilized a little more effectively. You give that sucker to this to the Pirate Starworks, and you have a huge advantage in your trading. Uh, so it'll be exciting to. I mean, it's essentially like if you take on two of them, you've got a pretty good odds of ending up with, if not a Pristine Nano Forge, at least a very nice colony item. Because these are the rarer colony items. Yeah, that definitely makes the the, the probe space, the um, the derelict space, worth exploring deeper. I used to get frustrated with that because um, the, the rewards were not always consistent. But now that there's a consistent reward with the derelict mothership, yeah, that's, that's nice. Very happy to see that. Um, can now hold down Alt and move the mouse without clicking to quickly transfer items. Hey! Enabled by default. I'm so happy for this because I have been trying. I keep forgetting to go and enable this myself. Seeing this just be the default now, I am so happy. Because <laughs> I was always trying to use mods for transfer all. And, uh, yeah, very happy to see that out, that alt thing being enabled by default. I don't know why it wasn't from the start. As soon as they implemented it and realized it was it worked, that should have just been always implemented. All right, so... <clears throat>
here's some big chunky part there's a lot in here that I want to talk about yeah <laughs> the idea that I was gonna get through this in an hour <laughs> oh all right um so ECM rating now the skills and related ECM rating reduce enemy weapon range by the ECM rating uh, both sides can have a penalty at the same time penalty is capped at a maximum of 10% so it's no longer a fight after being capped the penalty is reduced by the ratio of the enemies and player ECM ratings both sides have the same ECM rating each side's penalty is reduced 50% interesting okay so there's always essentially going to be a penalty now of one form or another it's just that uh curious how that works out now. I'm about to go in and read, like, I'm about to go in and read them. Read it, because oh, so this is a change to the ECM rating period. Alright. Hmm. Because it used to be, I think, that there was an increase. Wasn't it? I forget exactly. I mean, it's still, it does, I don't think it changes anything based on, like, how I build my fleece and set up my officers, but it is something I'm going to have to keep in mind now. As I always, uh, I don't lean into ECM rating hard, but it is always on my mind of something that I want to make sure that I'm covering. So I tend to use um, officers with gunnery implants, because when you maximize that skill, it really uh, does a good job of making sure your fleet has a good ECM rating. So now it's just going to be... I'm going to have to look into that more when we get into game. Um, Electronic Warfare retains the plus one ECM rating from all combat ships. Uh, makes combat objectives by be captured much more quickly and from longer range. Interesting. And most remnant fleets no longer have it. Also interesting. I would think that this would be something that they would have. But I guess now it's to, it's a little too good if they all always have it. Eh, I don't know. Cybernetic Augmentation. This is another big change. So Cybernetic Augmentation and Neuralink got swapped. Uh, I'm happy for this because Neuralink seems like something that's very interesting, but to have to sink so many points into technology to get it always felt awkward. Um, and a Cybernetic Augmentation always felt underpowered, especially for where it was in the list. Uh, I'd much rather take... Um, I think I forget what the skill is. Officer management, I think, is the skill. Gives you an extra elite skill as well as extra officers. Or it was an extra level. I think it was an extra level. And it might not be officer management that I'm thinking of. But the uh, the leadership skill that increased elite, uh, the number of elite skills also increased the level. Yeah. And that one to me always seemed so much better than cybernetic augmentation. Like, I could have two extra elite skills or I could have another whole level and an extra elite skill. And there's usually only one or two skills that I want to elite anyway. But now, we have Cybernetic Augmentation is now a top tier skill, replacing Neuralink, which moves down. Increases the number of elite skills officers can have by one, was two. So that got a nerf. I'm guessing because there's better stuff. Now it also increases damage dealt slash reduces the damage taken by all ships with officers. All ships with officers. Shipwide, fleet-wide buff. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's really nice. That means that... Ooh. I really like that. Now I'm going to struggle, though, in vanilla to try and decide where I want to put all my skills. Because if I have to have five skills in technology to get that, five skills in leadership to get the other one, oof. Yeah, now, I'm, now, now I actually have choices. Interesting. The bonus is 1% per elite skill the player has. Oh, well, I don't ever have elite skills anyway. <laughs> Rip! So this is only useful if your own officer has elite skills, which I very rarely have in vanilla, because a lot of the elite skills, in my opinion, even when you make them elite, are just not worth taking on your main character. The damage bonus is doubled for the, for the flagship, so your officer... Yeah, it's just... So this is just not going to be worth it. In vanilla, when you only have 15 levels, I do not find... The elite skills worth taking. The only one I ever would bother with would be um, combat readiness, because of the 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 bonuses it gives you. Or no, field modulation was the only one. Because combat readiness, the elite skill is not super important. But with field modulation, the elite skill is 
so good. So the fact that, like, so this isn't that great. It's good if you're, like, like if you're doing a combat-focused fleet. The thing is, though, is that, like, if you're doing, if you're going to take advantage of this, it means you want to have at least... A, like at least five skills, I would say. So you're gonna have five skills in technology. You're probably gonna be focusing on leadership as well to get more fleet wide buffs. That's five more skills there. Uh, you can get gunnery implants at the very least to uh, make that elite. But then it's like you're gonna want five skills in combat to get the most use out of this. Oof. I don't know how I feel about this. Eh. Well, I am happy though to see that the neural integrator, whole, uh, the neural link, got moved down a tier because that makes that much more viable. Happy for that at least. Uh, significantly reduces the OP costs as the, of the neural integrator, same as the neural interface. Increases the ship's deployment point supply cost by twenty percent instead. All right, that's nice. Reduce the OP cost. Happy to see that uh, because I, you know, it, that was always the issue with doing the neural link was like you're kind of debuffing the ships in order to make a use of it. Uh, move down a tier. Clarify skill description. Oh, you know what, though? This, along with cybernetic augmentation, is kind of viable since you doubles the flagship uh, bonus. So if you did five points in tech, and if you're doing solo, you wouldn't take a lot of leadership or industry um ones anyway. Usually all I would do is get containment procedures for the better fuel. Um, so that leaves you with quite a few points to put into combat. So you can get a very large buff from cybernetic augmentation. So yeah, this is this is kind of cool. These synergize well together, these changes. Uh, clarify skill description slash related hull mod tooltips. We'll now set auto fire state to group defaults when switching ships for the first time. Okay. That's alright. I mean, I don't ever really need that too badly. I still have an issue with the way that the Neuralink works, though. But my biggest problem with Neuralink is that is having to count on the AI to fly my ship every time I leave it. Like, ugh, that's just so brutal. Like, ugh. But I haven't really... Like, I, I, I only play with it a little bit. We'll have to test it out and see exactly... I definitely am glad I waited to do a run with it till after this patch, that's for sure. Uh, ballistic Mastery added plus 5% damage dealt by Ballistic Weapons to the Elite Effect. So that's more on top of what it already did, I'm guessing, which is good. So I think the Elite Effect was just increasing projectile uh, speed. Target Analysis, plus 10 damage to Destroyers is now an Elite Effect added... Extra elite effect plus five percent damage to frigates. Interesting. Um, also retains original elite effects. That. Hmm. That's a bummer, but honestly, not that big of a loss. The ability for uh, frigates to punch up to destroyers was really nice on target analysis. It's I still think it's one of the best skills to have on an officer because um, it allows ships to punch up really well. I don't know that I'm going to bother with making it elite, though, because destroyers aren't scary enough for me to really be worried about this. I take target analysis because it allows my <clears throat> ships to swarm cruisers and capital ships effectively. So this isn't really that big of a loss. If anything, it's nice, because if I do decide to make it elite, we can get extra damage to frigates, although that's such a small number that I don't know that I would bother messing with this. The main time I make it elite is on my main character to um, improve the omens um, EMP because having the uh, the elite effect on target analysis just doubles your damage against systems and that turns the EMP into basically a light switch. You just flip it and then this, all the ship shuts down. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, systems expertise. Change elite to minus 10% damage taken. Ooh. That's nice. Uh, that 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 is worth investing in for sure. 
Like I used to only put systems expertise on officers if they were in a sh like if they were specialized for a specific ship with specific expertise. But now this is like I might want to push them specifically towards those ships to make the most use out of systems expertise. Uh, it's a, if it says just damage taken, then yes, it does work on shields. Like the way it's written here, it absolutely should re um, affect shields as well. We'll have to get into the game to look at it. I, after I go through this full list, I'm going to pull up the game, and we're going to look at the um, the way that the the screen, the skill screen. Oh, look, real quick. Um, there are four different skill categories or aptitudes. There are two broad types of skills. Uh, coming in at uh, fresh may seem obvious. The skills that boost your fleet are way better than the skills that boost your flagship. Boosting more things. Blah. blah. Uh, no, it does not turn out to be wrong. It's absolutely fucking right. You did, like, I don't this, see. This is another thing where it's a mentality thing. Is like, I understand not everyone plays the way I do, but with the way I play, this is absolutely correct. It's not more complicated. Ship wide buffs are way better than individual ship buffs because I am flying a frigate nine times out of ten, which means my buffing my ship is nowhere near as good as buffing all of the wolf pack. So this uh, this is again like you know much love to Alex, but they are definitely wrapped up in the way they play things and the high profile like people who build a lot of capital ships and big fleets is definitely the big focus of a lot of the talk. But Wolfpack completely invalidates this opinion. I'm sorry, it does. If you are running a Wolfpack, you absolutely need the skill wide buffs. It's not even a matter of like being wrong or right, or more complicated. No, you need the ship-wide buffs because your fleet is so small. Like, by, your wolf pack is tiny. You need all the buffs you can get. But again, this is just a matter of, like, a lot of times these updates seem to be targeted with, like, the, with the description. Very seems to, seems to match that play style of build big fleet. And, I mean, it's like, Wolfpack is there. It's right there. It's one of the main leadership skills that changes how you play the game. Ugh, anyway, under the control of a good pilot, personal personal ship's skills make a huge difference, and your flagship can make an outsized impact on the battle. This is absolutely true. However, it is also true with a frigate. Uh, me and an omen with target analysis is all I need to to be a huge impact to a fight and make a huge difference. I don't need, and it allows me to have these fleet wide skills. Like this is this is again the mentality of my my officer, my main officer is gonna be flying the biggest ship, which is not at all the mentality I play with. Very rarely do I fly the biggest ship, and if I am flying a big ship, it's usually only in niche fights. It's n like I'll take a big I'll take a griffin in when I'm fighting a star uh, a spaceport. But even then, if I have other big ships with me, I'm not piloting them. My officers are because the officers have these individual skills and I will be much better suited in my Griffin or in a frigate than I will be in one of those bigger ships because I haven't taken those skills. Like I understand the mentality here, you know, talking to players that do focus on flying those big ships themselves. But to me, it's still not even, it's not, it's not a it's not an issue. It's not a complicated thing. These skills are just better for you to take. Like I completely disagree with this opinion. But again, play styles make a huge difference. Uh, anyway. Um the point they're trying to make is that the balance between these two types of skills is inherently player skill dependent or preference dependent in the case of the player just wants to command their fleet. This means that there's no specific value where personal ship skill A would be uh, will be balanced when compared to fleet wise skill B. Rather, what we're adjusting here is the amount of piloting skill a player needs to have make to make a personal ship wide skills worth it. Okay. I get I get it now. I get it a little bit better now. Um, and I appreciate this, but it's, I still think that, uh, the mentality is, is ignoring a whole, like, niche way to play the game, but essentially it's going to make 
it sounds like they're buffing the skills that I don't think are worth taking is the goal, which is good. A long term to do item to improve the elite effects of the piloted skill ships and brief those skills have a special bonus you can unlock. Your officers can only get a little number of those, but your player can unlock all of them. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so now they're going over the different ones. Um, I don't know that I want to go through the notes. I think I'm just going to go back and continue reading. Okay, ECM rating. Let's read what they have to say here. Um, I'm going to wait for a minute because Twitch is currently on an ad break. So I'm going to wait until that finishes before I really dive into this. But I'm going to skim through it now. Um, the skill effects pass was done with the exception of gunnery implants and it was time to tackle ECM rating. In brief, each fleet gets an ECM rating. These are... Um, yeah, the and that's the thing too, is like, I understand how why the big fleets are like why a lot of people play that way because when you play that way and you've got your fleet set up right like it really does feel like you are having a huge impact because you are any ship that the player flies over the ai is having a huge impact um you don't need skills to do it but you absolutely can turn into a scary monster capital ship by having all those skills it's just that I don't think it's as cut and dry. Like, there's a lot more nuance throughout it. Like, honestly, with um, field modulation, target analysis, and, like, with just those two skills, you already buffed the ship significantly. And you can pile more on, but you also get a ton from the fleet-wide bonuses as well. Especially things like um, coordinated maneuvers and... Um, was some of the other ones. Coordinated maneuvers is a big one because uh, tactical drills buffs damage across the fleet. Uh, just having a good combat readiness is one of the best ways to buff your fleet. Just making sure you're you have all the stuff to keep that combat readiness as high as you can possibly get it is a big enough buff by itself. And having um, skills that allow you to push that further, like getting the um, I think it's hull restoration that increases combat readiness for each built-in hull mod. Like, that alone is, is well worth it. Alright, so real quick, the ECM rating. I'm going to go into this because I was struggling to try and figure out exactly what their changes meant. Uh, so each fleet gets an ECM rating. For those of you that aren't aware, this is like the silent battle that's constantly going on. <laughs> it really does, like, if you're not aware of this, it's swinging a lot of fights like, like against you and being aware of ECM rating, building your fleet towards at least addressing it somewhat is very important. Um, these are compared and the loser's weapon range is reduced by the amount lost by capped at a 10% maximum. The problem is that if an enemy fleet has a really high ECM and having a little ECM doesn't help you even a bit, they have enough to max out your penalty regardless, and the main current endgame enemy uh, have very high ECM. So it's extremely binary, either not put nothing in it, or absolutely max it out using every trick in the book. Anything in between is pointless. This isn't good. Okay, so I agree here. This is 100%. Okay, so I see what they were aiming for now. I still don't know that I like how they handled it, <coughs> but... I totally get the uh, the why they changed it and why they changed it the way they did because it was very much like this. It's like early on, it's it, you can have a little bit of ECM and it's good, but as the game progresses, like if you don't have a fleet specialized to it, you're just going to be at minus ten. Period. <laughs> so now that I know, I've already read the section in the patch notes about it. I, I totally get now why they changed it so that it essentially it's working both ways and then it's swung by the difference so like even if you have a little bit of ecm at least you'll have some effect on the enemy fleets so it makes it a little more balanced yeah i mean i mean it's you know whenever they say redacted we know who they're talking about <laughs> i mean that doesn't necessarily doritos specifically either this is just any of the end game redacted fleets tend to have a very high ecm rating 
so it, it it's nice to see this changed so that more players will actually engage in this mechanic. Although it's still, in my opinion, not fully explored. I like the idea of there being some skills that are related to this, like something in the command pa panel, where you could like engage in hacking enemy ships, maybe uh, using certain abilities that like like the um like being able to shut down an enemy ship that's vulnerable like i i feel like there's a way you can expand ecm to uh to do more like have more like i just there's just more <laughs> mm. um well i'm expecting to find something interesting <clears throat> when we're exploring the abyss but um it would be nice to see some endgame faction buffs. Uh, I mean, the endgame in general is where this game really falls flat and mods really help out. Um, but without getting too deep into the spoilers, it, it would be nice to see to have more stuff in the endgame. Hopefully the, uh, the new Colony Crisis events will ma at least make the endgame feel a little more interactive. Like, there's still stuff going on with that system, hopefully, to uh, make a long-term vanilla playthrough at least a little more exciting. Um, there have been some excellent suggestions made on the forum. The main point of the specific suggestions was to have one size ECM reduce the other weapon's side so that both sides end up with reduced range, and one side having more ECM doesn't cancel the other out. Uh... Cuts enemy range by half the rating to maximum 10%. This is maxes out 20. Alright, hold on. What is this? a perfect system where the system works well for the ECM rating numbers. You'll likely encounter a game and without new, new CM rules. ECM rating cuts enemy range by half of the rating to a maximum 10%. So this maxes out at 20% ECM. Okay, so if you have 20, so 20 is the, the one to go for. Um take over uh no not th nothing that extreme where you're taking over ships with it uh, but being able to disable a ship or maybe disable ship weapons like direct a hack at a specific ship to disable its weapons or to reduce like its range i just think like there's there's an opportunity here for like doing debuffs on enemy ships and enemy fleets like maybe targeting a specific ship makes it stronger than targeting the whole fleet and, uh, or you could potentially have, like, just, I, I like the idea of hacking and electronic warfare being expanded upon. Because I feel like, while I'm much more of an active player, I'm flying my own ship, I'm very rarely pausing and looking at the fleet, I'm just counting on my fleet to fly correctly. The, uh, the players who are more passive, where they're, you know, their ship's on autopilot if they're even deployed as an officer, and they're, ma they're managing their ships... There's a whole spot there to expand how they can interact with the game by adding electronic warfare as part of it. And in my opinion, it wouldn't even need to be a big, huge overhaul. It would just be a matter of, like, <clears throat> you can uh, do certain hacking, um, like, hacking uh, skills. So there's, like, be, like, a whole little hot bar when you pop open your tactical screen of, like, skills you can engage with and maybe having certain ships... In your fleet or certain hull mods um, on your ships would it give you benefits or expand that your options for that you could also have you know text tech skills expanding options as well and combat skills like there's a whole area here where you could have a whole new layer of combat built into the tactical screen of electronic warfare and it could be something that really could make or break fights um and it would be something that, since you can pause the game to engage a tactical screen, even if you are an active flyer like me, it would still be something that's be worth playing around and playing towards. I really hope that we see something like that getting implemented in the future. Um, but the, just having this new change, and honestly, I... Uh, uh, the changes that they've put in here to like aren't terrible 
Like, I like that Electronic Warfare is is a little bit buffed now, because it always felt like the only reason I was taking it was because I needed a fifth skill to get to drone ships. <laughs> or a fourth skill so I could get to drone ships. Or a fifth or a sixth skill, because I'm trying to get drone ships and Neuralink. <laughs> like, those were the only reasons I would take Electronic Warfare. I almost always take um, the Flux, the, uh, the phase ship skill, because it increases um, combat readiness for phase ships and also increases the amount that they uh, cloak your fleet. So for me, that skill was always the skill to take. And Electronics Warfare, I only ever grabbed it if I was like, I had a spare skill. Nine times out of ten, I would just use elite gunnery implants on all my officers to make my ECM rating good. But now, like, the having the longer range on capturing, I don't know if that's really that great. Uh... I don't know, this is... There's a lot to read about a part of the game that, while I definitely appreciate, it doesn't really... Like, it impacts fights, and if you're not aware of it, it impacts them quite a bit. But... I don't think this is going to change the way I approach things. I'll have to look into it again once we get into the... When we get into the game, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'm going to look over the whole skill page for a bit before we start. Um, cybernetic Augmentation... Uh, yeah, I thought that was just boring as hell. It's definitely not useful. So, um... Uh, too many elite skills? No, not really. I don't think that's an issue. I think the issue is that the officers don't level up enough. Um... So, yeah, the new... I don't think cybernetic augmentation is super great for the way I play. But I do feel like it's going to be great for those players that uh, focus on flying their capital ship and maxing their character to fly that capital ship. This is going to be a great skill for them. Uh, it definitely makes investing in the combat tree have a big payoff at the end. When you can now buff your entire fleet as well as your main ship. So for that style of play it's great, but for the wolf pack... I don't know, maybe there still is some Wolfpack Tactics application here. Like, if I if I specialize myself in a certain way... Well, it's definitely something I'm going to want to uh, explore when I have the mod for um, increasing my level. Like, where you can level up back past 15. But if I'm just going to level 15, I don't know that I want this. Because there's too many, like... I am... I play, like, a very specific way at this point where hull restoration is almost required, and having uh, Wolfpack Tactics is just too too good. Getting the higher level skills, like getting Fleet Doctrine is so good. Uh, support Doctrine, that's what it was. So good. Like There's just so much in the yellow and green that I love. Yeah, like that's what I was just talking about myself, Rise, that there's not a lot here. If you're a green yellow fan, this is mostly a red line going to blue as a secondary, which yeah, sure, works out for them. I don't think they needed the buff, but I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe this is like something that they really was needed if that was your play style. But I'm definitely gonna try and break this because uh, tactical drills on top of this with Wolfpack Tactics. So I just get one, two, three, four. I forget which one it is. That's the good one. Then we don't get the Support Doctrine. Go up to five here. It's nine. Go up to three here and maybe take one of these. Because normally I get Field Repair and Bulk Transport. Maybe we skip Bulk Transport, just get Field Repair. And then uh, take one of those to get another Elite Skill. So that's 4, 3, 7, 5, 12. It gives me three more skills up here, and I can make five of them elite, giving me an extra 5% across the board for damage, maybe to 10. Support Doctrine is great. Swarm of three DP lashes should still be viable. <laughs> I actually have to uh, 
to, to play with that at some point. Try that out. Yeah, Support Doctrine is fantastic because giving all of your ships combat uh, endurance means that they're getting they're getting buffed. Uh, if you have um, oh, I almost forgot about um, I forget what the skill's called, but the one that buffs your combat readiness across the fleet. Uh, long story short, though, with um, I think it's crew training and tactical drills, it's like a twenty five percent increase to combat readiness, which gives you like a five percent damage buff and a five percent damage reduction. Yeah, crew training that was the one. Like those, that alone is well worth it. Like forget getting tactical drills, which is just a five percent damage boost. This is boosting your offense and defense. Plus, it gives you co more combat readiness. So that as it start, if you your combat readiness starts decreasing, it has more to burn through before you run out. And if you re-engage quickly, having that extra combat readiness, like in, in a uh, follow-up fight, will allow you know you to deploy more ships because more of them are going to actually be ready to fight. The, ah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, oh boy, that's a name. Red Barber, is it Red Barber? Red Barbers, Red Barbers laugh. But uh, yeah, the the top speed increase was something I was forgetting because a five percent top speed increase in combination, especially with coordinated maneuvers, like oh, it, it's so good having that extra top speed. Like your ships move, being able to maneuver, like this is the reason why I don't play with larger ships is because they're too clunky. They can't position the, like they, they're too easily like too easily baited into bad positioning by the enemy. And they're too dumb to realize when they're making bad moves. Even when they're set to cautious, they'll still out like get into bad positions. And in a larger ship, they can't maneuver to get out of those bad positions. Whereas the smaller ships have that ability to maneuver to get out of those bad positions. But like having that little extra top speed is so good, especially with the, the smaller ships. Yeah, having good combat readiness is just a huge buff across the whole fleet. Is absolutely something to keep in mind. Um, the Neuralink buff. Very happy to see that Neuralink integrator hull restoration. Oh uh oh. Uh, getting rid of Demos. Blah, blah blah. The complaint about this one is that you get into the end game. It doesn't help you very much in combat. I disagree. The counter argument is that with this skill, you can afford to lose ships since you can cover them easily, and this unlocks more aggressive and potentially stronger playstyles. This counter argument is. Why do this if you could invest in skills to make you stronger more directly and not use ships in the first place? I don't like any of this argument. Um, <clears throat> I think there's some truth to both the counter and counter counter. What, with that in mind, what sort of in combat bonus would make sense here? The general idea is that you should still be able to afford to lose ships. It's original flavor and industry, so I don't want the skill to boost ships directly. How about this? Pristine or near pristine ships with at most one demod have the deployment points cost reduced by 10% or 5 points, whichever is less. Ha! What? What? That's huge. Man, I liked the skill already. You didn't need to buff it. That was my... I kept saying, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Like, it's because I don't think... Like, okay, first of all, this is the skill that when you build in... I, does it still say it? Uh, combat, blah, 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 deployment point cost, uh... I could have swore this was the one that if you built in demods. No, I'm actually thinking of support doctrine. Like, but this was already, in my opinion, the best skill in the game. Because I don't want to lose ships, so I always have um, reinforced bulkheads. But as soon as I get this skill, it essentially discounts the OP cost on all of my ships because I can now take those bulkheads out and put something else in. So for me, Hull Restoration was basically a 10 to 20% Ordnance points uh, boost across my whole fleet, on top of you know getting to freely restore ships. Very good. This is insane. Like holy crap! Did they take the one off of support doctrine? No. <laughs> oh freaking a. <laughs> Hey, so about yellow green boy is not getting anything? This is insane. Oh my god. There's no way this stays here. People already called this skill too good because it kind of like nerfs the whole survival aspect of like ships just dying and just needing to play around that. But like, oh my god. 
This is a big buff. Alright, well now I'm really excited to get into the game. Because this is my... I automatically, like, you know... Transverse jump right off the bat. Bulk, um, increased storage. And then sensors. Like, that's my... my that is my Triforce of early game. Like, that, that that's it. Period. And then I go down yellow in order to get uh, containment procedures, especially, uh, to get hull restoration. Now it's like, that's obvious. Like, you need that. You get that. <laughs> oh, my lordy. So whichever is less means big ships will not get a huge reduction, just the five, on the biggest ships. But just that 10% reduction, because that's, I'm assuming, going to, like, I wonder how that's going to work with frigates. Like, if you'll get at least one point reduction. Or if it'll be, like, it'll actually count the decimal. So I'm thinking of, like, the LP Brawler specifically. A 10 point, a ten percent reduction is only going to drop it to 5.4. So, will that mean, like, every tenth one is free? Am I doing the math right? Yeah, every tenth one would be free. So, like, I, I'm going to definitely have to look at this in game to see how it affects smaller fleets but the mid like there's now a huge opening for destroyer and cruiser fleets like go wide with the wide ships not the biggest ships just the medium ships get that support doctrine get that whole restoration oh man um yeah that's what i'm wondering myself is if the minimum discount is going to be one um, I couldn't remember if Support Doctrine did that or not. Now, the next question is, if I have both, how does that work? Well, Support Doctrine is also 20%. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how that works out. So, with 30% reduction means almost two points. So, like, will the LP Brawler with both skills cost four? Or will it cost uh, 4.2 and it's like every, I'll only notice it every five ships. I don't know. We'll have to play around with that. I'm, I'm really hyped to see that, see how that works out. That's a huge buff. All right, support doctrine. Uh, another skill I thought needed help. No, it does not need help. All right. Um, I'm not actually 100% on this one. See how it goes. Uh, see how the top uh, tier leadership skill that competes with best of the best, which is really good. I don't, I mean, yeah. Well, unless you build more things. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Best of the best was the one that I was thinking of, where you get uh, combat readiness improvement for deploy for uh, having um, support skills built in. Okay, but I still thought support doctrine was really good. But cause, So those are the two that I actually really like. I, a lot of times, if I'm not doing a high-tech te thing, I'll end up going to get both these elite skills, because then having that extra combat readiness is just so... Good. I cannot stress this enough. Combat readiness is the biggest buff in the game. It, it It's just too good. Um, so, alright. Support Doctrine, on the other hand, gives your ships without officers the effects of some skills and then makes them cheaper to deploy. Right now it gives non-elite officers uh, non-elite effects of three skills, changing it to give four. So we also get Ordnance Expertise. Yeah, this might make it too close to an officer ship. And... Unaugmented officer can still have four five skills. One of them elite. On the other hand, support doctor skills are not handpicked by the player, and it's not. Uh, yeah, well, officer skills are barely handpicked. You still have to play the lottery to get the ones you want. But anyway, uh, and it's not an amazing combination. This is also true. This is why I didn't think it was that bad in the first place. Having three skills, um, it was just that those skills were always useful. I don't think ordnance expertise is really going to be that great. Like, like, how is this going to show up? Like, I'm thinking of Ordnance Expertise correctly, right? Hold on, let me let me get to that skill page, since we're talking about it so much. Uh, new game. Um, I'm going to play a new file. Oh, let's just pick familiar. Let, you know what? Let's just go with... No, see, I can't decide. No, I've got Decision Paralysis. Random. There we go. Captain, generate. Kelly Cannon, no thank you. No thank you. Lindsay, no thank you. Athena, and Athena Anderson. I like that, AA. Okay, we'll go with Athena Anderson, Iron Mode. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do the Explorer start, because we're going to try to do the Explorer quick start. Still, skip tutorial. All right, uh, now I've forgotten what I was looking for. <laughs> oh, you know what? I didn't check that. Hold on.
Let me uh double check what we got here. Um this one's been touched up. It's not new, but it's different. She looks older than she used to. The old one was of lower res. Uh, I, this guy was not player pickable before, so you're correct. There is a new portrait there. I don't believe he was player pickable. I think that was a special portrait before. Um, now that I know that they've touched that one up, I'm going to look closer at some of these other ones. They're rearranged, I think. Right? Because I think some of these used to be at the bottom, and now they're up here at the top. Yeah, for sure. She used to be more towards the bottom. So they've brought a lot of the ind like the, the independent pirate characters up to the top. Um, I don't see anything jumping out at me right away. Is he new? He looks new. I don't remember seeing him. Oh yeah, no, these two are just flat out new. These all this this whole line here. These four are completely new. Oh, here's a couple others. Yeah, 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 you're right. These are definitely more pirate-themed. Um, quite like them. They're very nice. Uh, I like the the bob cut on this one. I, it's kind of funny that I think that's the first bob cut we get. We got a bull cut, but we don't, have, I don't think we have a bob. That's nice. Uh, I like the head wrap on that one. I think the head wraps are kind of cool. We've got definitely seen a lot of those on different characters. Um, and the angled armor... Which one is that? This one here? Or this one? I mean, I like seeing some more armored ladies in general. I'm very happy with that. Uh, this one's really cool. Quite like that. I like the hairdo. I like the mask. Uh, I like her hairdo as well, too. Um, I like this guy. This guy's kind of cool. I like the, the, the flight mask look. This guy is kind of cool, too. I feel like he's going to be a a quick favorite for a lot of people with the red symbol on it. Yeah. Yeah. I like this one as well. Um, but this guy, I feel like is going to become a quick favorite of people. <laughs> he just looks too much like a lot of sci-fi characters that are beloved. Like I like it. This is a good, it's a good picture. Um, this guy, we got, we finally have our dwarf player. Like for me, I was already happy with my goblin lady, which that's got a touch up. Now that I'm looking at it again, her eyes have been touched and so, like somewhat something about this face is different. Like it's more high resolution or something. It's got more scars on it too, kind of like um what's this one? Uh where's she at? This one. How she's kind of got like this scarred up face. You can kind of see that a little bit more on here. But to me this was always like the goblin and now we have the dwarf. <laughs> like when I when I go to do a playthrough of armor only, I already, I know who my guy is now. <laughs> um, did anyone else get new portraits? Uh, he's gotten a touch up. Like he was not that well defined before. That's definitely a touch up on him. Uh, this one's new, I think, or it might be another one that's touched up that just blended in before. She's definitely got a touch-up. That's nice. I'm noticing that a lot of these touch-ups... I think she got her touch-up last patch. As I, I remember her scars being more prominent before. Um, so that's not, I don't think that's a new touch-up. I'm noticing that a lot of these touch-ups have the eyes off-center. So they're not just staring down the camera as much. Because I don't remember her eyes being off to the side like that before. As clearly... So, like, I'm noticing that with a few of the old ones. Like, her stare is now off-center. Uh, the portrait of the office, uh, the hegemony officer friend. I'm trying to remember who that was. Like, I, oh, hold on. There's more head, like, well, this is split weirdly. So we have this chunk is hegemony officers. Whereas this chunk is now Tritachion. And we have more Tritachion here. Switching into the Luddic. But then there's Luddic here. Are these guys Luddic now? I'm confused. But, um... This guy. Is he in here twice now? Oh, he just got a new picture. So there was this guy. Who I think is the old one. And then... This guy is a new one? Well, 
with the NVG ocular thing. Is that this guy yet? Or is it this guy? Is this guy completely new? I think he's completely new. Because I'm confusing him with... Uh, where is it? I'm, I'm confusing him with this guy, I think. Like, he's kind of like... Like, I don't... Now that you've brought my attention to it, yeah, I don't remember him. He might be new as well, then. He's definitely new. These two, right here. This will line up, potentially. Or, the, you know what? No, 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 no. They're not new. These have been upgraded, updated. Yeah. So these are definitely more higher definition. Oh, I like the update they did on her. I kind of like the original still, though. Ah, uh, I don't like this update. For me, this picture, I always liked the original because it was so easy to mistake her for a him. This one, you can clearly see the hair a little bit better because the old one, it looked like she had a shaved head. And I liked that. But now it's very clear that, no, her hair is just pulled back. But it's easier to see her as a female now, but I, I really liked the the um, the androgyny of the original portrait much more. But yeah, a lot of these have been touched up. So, these aren't new. This one might be new. I don't think they are, though. I think they've just all been touched up and enough that they look very different. Um, he looks similar to that one officer you talked to about the academy. He might be exactly that, because if we come up here again, uh, this guy is an NPC in the game. I'm almost certain that that's the, one of the, the, like, maybe not, maybe he just looks similar to the NPC. Not, but I don't remember exactly. But, oh, there's another bob cut. I think this one is new. I don't remember that one being there at all. But it may just be another case of, like, I didn't like the original and just ignored it. Yeah, it's nice to see these touched up. Uh, I'm not, like, this is the only situation here, uh, this la the lady here, where I think I dislike it and would prefer the original. But, um, it's still nice to see the love and tender love and care given to him. Yeah, a lot of these look sharper, more defined. And then we hit the bottom of the list. Yeah, so it's, it's hard for me to notice the new ones. Because so many of the older ones were touched up that, uh... Like, I don't remember her. Maybe she's new, and I don't remember him either. Huh. Anyway, we came here to look at skills. Um, you know what? Who am I going to take now? Let's take one of the new portraits. Let's, uh, you know what? I'm tempted to grab him just to do it. But I think I want to, you know what? He's not new to this portrait pack, but I have not used this one yet. So I'm actually going to use this one. We are always capped in iron mode. No help. Ow, wing. <laughs> AOE, wing. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Mima, no, not Mima. Second Noel. No. Zeus Nessus, no. 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 Norton Zwong. I like that. Norton Zwong. Norton doesn't match Zwong, though. I don't think it matters. Uh, nope. Nope. Friday Win. Hell yeah. Perfect. Perfect name. Friday Win. Perfect. Alright. Skip, skip, skip. Okay. We were talking about support doctrine. Uh, best of the best. Uh, let's just build one more permanent hull mod. I could have sworn that was the one. Yeah, here, no, 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 no. It is hull restoration plus fifteen percent maximum readiness for all ships. Yeah, and then I could have swore one of these also improved ships by 5% for stuff. Yeah, Mexico America is a great random name. I like that. I like that they use, that like, the, the choices for the names, I really like that, uh, what they've done with, the, with them. Like, I usually randomize my names and then go from there. Okay, so we were talking about, let me pop open the tabs and then maybe it'll help me remember 
we were talking about support doctrine and hull restoration and being busted. Uh, target analysis, systems expertise, missile specialization, reduced the bonus rate of fire to 25% was 50. Reduced missile hit bonus to 25% was 50. Added elite effect plus 50, 25 missile ammo regeneration rate. Okay. That's nice. I don't know what the nerf was needed for. Uh, does it talk about this? Don't. It's not a special spot for that. Oh, is it crew training? Well, crew training is across the board. I meant there was one that when you had... Um, this is plus 15. Uh, there was one where if you had um, S mods built in, it gave you like a 5% combat readiness. Yeah, missile regen is... That's what I was getting at. So like the the reduction for the rate of fire and for the missile hit points... I guess because of the the regen, they de they wanted to change it up. Only for missile weapons that regenerate ammo, though. So the regen rate is only for missiles that regenerate ammo. I wonder how that's going to work with some of the modded stuff that allows you to regenerate ammo on missiles, like the missile auto forges. I wonder if that'll trigger that. It should, I would think. Um, but the thing is, is that the fact that that it has that qualifier really doesn't really does not make this that great like this seems like it's just a straight up nerf wasn't it extra damage as well was that damage but uh changed no yeah i'm not sure that like that, that seems like it's a nerf all around um the missiles that regen in vanilla are the um salamanders and the LRMs, and that might be it. I think it's just the Salamanders and SRM. I wonder if it'll affect the reload time for the auto reloader, though. It just doesn't seem that great. Um, but there are a lot of missiles in modded factions that regen, so this will be great for that. But in general, this is just a straight up, like, this is a nerf. It's kind of a bummer. Oh well. I'm not, like, I like the skill, but it's not exactly like it's a, like, it's one of those skills where if I get an officer that starts with it, I'll build a ship for them. And usually a vigilance with a torpedo with a boom tube. <laughs> so, Cyclone Reaper on a vigilance so that they can have the extra ammo and build in the extra ammo and then just pump out missiles. Like, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> anyway, um, Helmsman ship. Change base speed bonus to 15 was 10. Change elite speed bonus to 10 SU per second was 5. Uh, nice to see that buffed. Helmsman ship always felt like it was not that amazing. The fact that this is also one of the skills you get with support doctrine is really nice. Um... And in general, I still don't know that it changes where I would place Helmsmanship on the tier list, but it does. It is noteworthy that this base skill bonus helps. Uh, it comes from comes like support doctrine gives you this at, on your ships, so it's a nice little extra speed there. And um, having uh, having it elite was something that I would tend to only do on redacted ships, so I'm not really sure how. Super useful that is. Helmsmanship is usually isn't a skill I take, and it's certainly not one I use for to make elite. Yeah, definitely. Well, helmsmanship on a, if you're playing with capital ships is almost required. So yeah, you got a good point there. Five more uh, five percent more speed for capital ships is going to be very nice, and the um the the flat bonus for having an elite will be very nice for capital ships. Um, you're also wondering if the um if the regeneration effect will affect the autoloader. Yeah, I mentioned that myself. Like, will this buff the autoloader's recharge? Hey, Rise, appreciate the follow. Why did that not come through my headphones? Oh, because I don't have my headphones turned on. <laughs> That'd be why. Um, yeah, so Helmsmanship, yeah, I didn't even think about that. That second bonus really helps out for capital ships. So, yeah, if you're... Uh, into the capital ships, that does move that a much higher on the list. Uh, that definitely makes that better. 
Uh, combat Endurance Elite Effect will now repair the hull up to 100%, was up to 50%. Glad to see that, because um, essentially this was a really good skill for bigger ships, and a completely worthless skill for frigates. Um, now, for prolonged fights, I may actually consider Combat Endurance being much better on my frigates and destroyers, since I can go up to 100%. Uh, I'm curious how that whole thing reads now. Let's... Uh... Combat Endurance. Because this is one that I would that I typically wouldn't make elite. Um, it's another one where it's only the redacted uh, ships where it would come up. So the maximum total repair is still either 2,000 points or 50% of the hull. Whichever is higher. So on a frigate, this is, yeah, this is going to be much better now. Okay. And they just got rid of the um the the penalty for it needing to be half destroyed before it starts kicking in. So yeah, that that's that's a nice change. It makes that more viable as an elite skill. Uh I still don't think it's changes how I rate combat endurance. It's already pretty top tier just for the uh the first effects. Like it doesn't need to be elite to be continue to be top tier. But now making it elite is a little more viable. Um, field modulation increases hard flux dissipation with seals are- Oh my god! <laughs> this is skill to not need a buff. <laughs> increases hard flux dissipation while shields are active to 20%, it was 15. And more overload reduction, yes. Oh my lordy. This skill was already, in my opinion, one of the top, top tier skills. And largely because of the uh, the hard flux dissipation while shields are active. Like, that could be 10% and I would still take it. Like, that is so good. And then also to have the overload duration chilled out as well. So good. This is already a skill. Like, I'm a huge fan of target analysis. And now with the changes to that, like, I'm still a huge fan of target analysis. Um... But it was not really a skill I would tend to make elite, except on my main character. On my main character, I do think it's the best combat skill to grab for a damage buff, and with field modulation being the best one to grab for a defense buff. But now, like, field modulation just got better. Even better. It's just so good. But these two skills, in my opinion, are the only skills that are red that are worth taking on the player, especially with the play style that I am play and now they're, they're, they're just the, the field modulation is now just even better even better like it wasn't good enough it's even better oh I mean just the fact that you can dissipate hard flux while shields are up a little bit more oh, it's just too good it's just so good uh, damage taken is incredibly powerful. Oh, minus damage taken is incredibly powerful, both in less damage taken and how it makes the AI more careful against you. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of these skills... I hadn't really thought about that, how they're, it's going to change the AI behavior. Um, because most of these are... I think the one that probably is going to change the most is just the fact that uh, l earlier on, there was a note that um, spilt in... S mods were not being considered for auto resolve. So I think the biggest change to the game is that whatever that fix was, I'm wondering if that was actually affecting how AI fleets would fly. Because if they're not considering their S mods, then they might be acting more skittish than they should be. I don't know. There's a, there's a whole section about AI changes we're going to get to as well. And hope and maybe it'll, uh, there'll be more in there about that. Um, damage control. I place elite effect with repairs uh, of damaged, but functional weapons and engines can continue while they are under fire. Interesting. Uh, you replace... I don't even remember what the old elite effect was for damage control. Um, wasn't it like it capped the amount of damage you could take from one attack, which essentially only mattered for reapers? Huh. Well, that's good, though. I'm glad to see that, because uh, damage systems comes up a lot. Although, honestly, 
this is gonna this is gonna hurt me more than it's gonna help me specifically because I don't take this skill that much, but enemy ships tend to have this skill and have it elite. So that's gonna be something I'm gonna have to keep an eye out for since I often fly ships with the intent of taking down weapon systems. Now I'm gonna have to keep in mind that enemy fleets, enemy ships that have damage control elite are gonna be that much harder to keep shut down. Yeah, that seems like, for me, for my playstyle, that's more of a buff for the enemies, as opposed to for the way I play. I don't even remember what the old one was. I think it was that it would just cap the damage to a certain amount from a single shot, but I don't think that was something that was really mattered, because most of the time, uh, that like the only thing that was hitting that threshold was going to be the Reapers, because everything else that does comparable damage did it over time, and I don't think was triggering that effect anyway. Like, if you get Tachyon Lanced, or plasma cannon, like that damage is happening over three shots or over multiple ticks. It's not happening all at once, so I don't think damage control was kicking in at all for those, even though those would hit you hard, uh, hard uh, just as hard as a Reaper would. Uh, and it was only one attack per two seconds or something like that. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's like, so you're, protect, you're, you're getting a slight mitigation from one Reaper shot, essentially. Um... Yeah, I, don't, I, I didn't like the way it, it was worded before. This is just... I'm, I'm not sure. Like, it's definitely better. It's definitely better. Yeah, because it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to come up a lot more often. Uh, ordinance expertise. Reduced base skill bonus to 1.5 uh, flux dissipation per ordinance point was 2. So you get nerfed ordinance expertise? I already never took this, and now it's worse? Now this is probably because it's now included in... Uh, where was it? In, uh, where's support doctrine? Oh, I was reading it over here. It's down here. Uh, added non elite. Yeah, yeah, that's why. Because they added support doctrine or added um ordinance expertise into support doctrine. So I guess they wanted to nerf it a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Ordinance expertise. It's always one that I never really thought much of. And especially, like, it's just not a good skill. I would always take Polarized Armor over Ordnance Expertise. And I wouldn't honestly take either of them, 9 times out of 10. Polarized Armor is just too good. Like, the the, the bonus um, resistance to EMP, the extra damage and reduction in general, like, it's, it's, it's a, if you're going to take one of these two, Polarized armor is the easiest choice over the other. I really just don't see this as being that great. Now, I mean, even if it said flux dissipation per ordinance point, period, it still wouldn't be that great. It's just not useful. Now, again, I fly smaller ships. I tend to play towards the wolf pack. So for me, this is really crap. It's, I'm just not going to get that much out of it. But if you're flying capital ships, even then it's like your your need for flux is so high that you may not even notice this. Uh, it's sort of good if you're climbing the yellow tree for combat power only, like you want to get hull restoration, but you're late game enough to not need... Yeah, um, yeah I can agree with that. Uh... Because you don't necessarily, like you say, you don't necessarily want containment procedures or makeshift equipment. Um, I still think both of those are fantastic. Uh, even if you're doing a combat focus. But if you are literally min-maxing for combat focus, you have a point there. Because you still want to probably take industrial planning if you're colonizing. But even if you're just focusing on combat, then yeah, I could see taking those two. Because you'll probably want... Uh, bulk transport still still really nice, but you may not even need that. So if you get field repairs and then two of those, like it it helps out. Yeah, I can see that. Like again, this is you know because I don't play that style, but if I was, I can see your point there for sure. Um, you'll probably take one now to elite for your wolf pack. Uh, do you mean the uh, one of these two? <laughs> no, <laughs> never. I don't take any either of these skills on my wolf pack ever. Uh, 
the fact that the officers only get five skills narrows down what I want on them so significantly. First of all, gunnery implants, period. It's universal buff to all weapons. Uh, well, all of the main weapons. Um, and I want the elite skill to increase my ECM rating. This is where I get my ECM rating from, is all of my officers are going to have elite gunnery implants. Uh, combat endurance is just so important. Field modulation, very important. Very rarely do I put an officer into a phase ship, so having the shields maxed as much as possible is really useful. Those three skills make up the core of my choices, and then target analysis on top of all four of those. After that, I'm a little flexible. Those four are basically required for every officer I take, and if you've been playing along, you'll realize that if I've only got one or sometimes two sometimes two skills extra, there's no way I'm taking these. <laughs> there's too many good things up here that I would want to grab as a fifth or sixth skill. Like, having the extra missile ammo, even on a ship that where the missiles are secondary, is really nice. Because it takes your swarm racks and buffs them. It takes your uh, annihilator rockets and buffs them. It takes a lot of various support missiles, and now allows the officer to spam them a lot more. I'm a huge pan, huge pan. I'm a huge pan. You can uh, fry up a lot inside of me, huge pan. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm a huge fan fan of the swarm racks, the small swarm missiles, because they're really good at allowing a ship that doesn't have a lot of PD to have an option to spam something out to, to hit fighters. Um, I play with the brawlers a lot, and this is a huge problem with the brawlers, is they can struggle taking down enemy fighter craft, or even just defending themselves enough from enemy fighter craft. But once you put swarm missiles on a bunch of them, they now have the ability to, like, your whole fleet, uh, your whole wolf pack of brawlers can now suppress enemy fighters while you focus on taking down those uh, ships that are uh, have the fighters, the carrier ships. So, Missile Specialization was one that I kind of did like, depending on what ships I was utilizing. Um, I also liked Systems Expertise quite a bit. Uh, and those two generally make up 5 and 6. Sometimes there'll be a Ballistics Mastery or an Energy me Weapons Mastery if I have that officer specialized in something. But generally, those are the skills I always take. Gunnery Implants, Elite. Combat Endurance, Field Modulation, Elite when I have officer training. Ta target analysis, which is just too good to pass up for a damage buff. And then up after that, I have free slots, and there's never going to be a polarized armor or ordnance expertise choice. The only situation I see that being a choice is if I had a officer specifically in a phase ship, I would want polarized armor. But even then, uh, what would I give up to get it is the problem. <laughs> Um, systems expertise was a new requirement on some ships. The new elite effects is very powerful now, though. Yeah, um, systems expertise having minus 10 damage taken is strong. That's going to be one where it's probably going to change my how I do the officers. Like, that's probably going to be the new fifth skill that I want to get a hold of. Just flat out. Because I can do elite field modulation... And instead of doing elite gunnery implants, maybe get ECM from somewhere else, do elite uh, field modulation and, and elite systems expertise. <sighs> See, it just makes me really want to consider now going for cybernetic augmentation to get that extra elite skill. Because <sighs> I really want three now. <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny that they ch how much they change cybernetic augmentation. Like, oh, 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 I didn't notice this. All ships with officers, but not AI cores. So that's not as strong and abusable as I originally thought. Didn't change anything else to say not AI cores, right? Because <laughs> that's, that's like the number one abuse in my fleet, if I go for tech, is to get the redacted ships to buff the wolf pack. Um... Oh, I see what you mean. For if I'm trying to do cybernetic augmentation, yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, I would definitely get polarized armor still over ordnance expertise. But yeah, I would want to grab at least one, if not maybe two. I mean, if we're talking about um, 
Barber's example. Would you prefer Barber or Rabarb? But if I'm talking about their example, um, then yeah, you would want both of these for that. But in my case, it would just be the polarized armor all the time. Why wouldn't he give cybernetic augmentation to the brains of our AI friends? I mean, it makes sense, though, because if it's cybernetic augmentation, this is stuff that sh that, that they would already essentially, like, how could they benefit from it? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You picked a name you thought would be annoying to pronounce. Congratulations. 10 out of 10. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah, I, I definitely won't be playing towards that this playthrough. But as soon as I start modding again, and I get the um, a whole new... I think it's called a whole new level. What's it? Hold on, let me check real quick. I have the... Uh, mod index. Uh, it's it's a whole new level. It is a whole new level. As soon as that gets updated, which it probably just needs to have that little number change. I don't think there's going to be much change. Uh, yeah. After um, when I start doing like quality of life mod playthroughs again, I think the very first thing I'll do is build towards cybernetic augmentations and min maxing it. Because then it'll be a little bit more viable when I have the extra skills to spend. Um, okay, so let's get through these skills. Ordinance expertise. Hull restoration. Somewhat faster repair of demods for ships with lower deployment points. Interesting. I wonder how that's actually going to play out. So like if it repairs a low, a weaker ship, was it will it recharge faster or will it just trigger faster? Because uh, this is actually something that I've played around when I get this skill, is usually when I get hull restoration, I will pay for the restoration on my frigates so that I won't waste the repair on them. But now if it happens faster, it might be fine to leave those on. Anyway, removed maximum CR increase per S mod. Yeah, yeah, see, that, that did used to be there. And added, a ma and added a flat. Yeah, okay, so this was a change. Yeah. So that was the one that it used to be, and this is the new one. Um, buff, straight buff, because it used to be... Okay, so this is a nerf for modded playthrough, where you could have, with progressive S mods, you could build more than two S mods. So I would have, like, five S mods built into ships sometimes. <laughs> so in that case, it's a nerf. But for vanilla gameplay, this is a straight-up buff. This is just so good. Because, I mean, with hull restoration, your fleet's going to be shiny most of the time anyway. Yeah, this is just a straight-up buff. This is fantastic. Uh, support Doctrine added. Ordinance Expertise. Uh, which, honestly, is such a, a weak skill that it's not even... Bar it's barely... It, it is, by definition, a buff. But it's like any other skill could have gone there and it would have been better. So they, they did a good job of uh, picking four of four skills to throw in there where you're not really getting a huge benefit. I mean, let's let's add it up. Let's add it up. So it used to be ignoring the, uh, no, let's not ignore anything. Let's go straight. Let, let's just look at these skills, though, and ignore the deployment cost reduction. And uh, just getting helmsmanship gave you maneuverability and top speed. That's been buffed to give you more top speed. Um, just 5% more, but still, it's going to be, it's going to be noticeable. Uh, damage control. Uh, which is less hull damage taken, less crew lost when hull damage from hull damage in combat, faster in combat weapon and engine repairs. All nice. Like that that was one where it's like I don't like taking this skill myself, but having it on support doctrine is definitely nice. It's not a bad skill, it's just not a like I can get a lot of that through other skills. Like the, the less crew lost containment procedures, less hull damage taken, while well, I'm already reducing my damage from a lot of different ways anyway. Like, that's not really a huge skill, but to have it in Support Doctrine is really nice. Then we've got Combat Endurance, which is so good mostly because of the combat readiness it gives you. And then on top of that, we're getting Ordnance Expertise, which is just a bit of Ordnance and a bit of a little bit of extra Flux Dissipation. So not super 
super strong of a buff. Just a tiny buff. Because really, combat endurance and the combat readiness increase was the biggest part of this buff. Oh, okay. Um, Twitch is running an ad right now. Oh, no! Damn it. That's a bummer. This is actually... This is a nerf that I don't appreciate. <laughs> I do not appreciate this. The containment procedures fuel reduction change to 25 was 50%. That's fair. Containment procedures, in my opinion, was really, really strong. Well, I guess we'll see how that actually affects things. I mean, I used to never have issues with fuel anyway. All right, so I'm going to take a quick five-minute smoke break. I've been running at the mouth nonstop for two and a half hours now. Ah. Uh. Oh. Right. Let's get settled back in. Yeah, so the ad cut me off when I was talking about uh, support doctrine. Like, this is a small buff to support doctrine. Um, but containment procedures, this is a big nerf. I wouldn't say worthless. Um, but as far as, like, because the maximum total wasn't changed, and if you're running a big fleet, that maximum was always what you were pushing up against anyway. So you, it's not really that noticeable for a big fleet. But for my small fleets, this is this is a big nerf. But I my fleets tended to still run like a surplus on fuel, essentially, with all the salvage I was getting. I don't think it's going to impact my play style or the guide that I was going to put out. I think this is still a very good skill to have if you're trying to build a self-sustaining fleet like a fleet that sustains itself off of salvage while exploring and that's not gonna hurt it too much anyway um now into the other stuff oh miscellaneous added auto fit variant for the wolf p it didn't have any added more random person names okay cool uh, made the dark gray text color in the UI a little brighter to make it more readable. Um, definitely nice. I can't think of any specific issues, but I know that that dark text was harder to read. Um, fixed rendering issue with composite mount indicator scale. Okay. Added enable UI noise setting to the gameplay settings. Nice. <laughs> I mean, that's not something I have a problem with. Um, if anything, I was having an issue where some of my UI noises weren't happening. Uh, that seemed to resolve when I reset, though. Uh, combat. Ships with a range zero fighters will no longer be assigned to fighter strike orders. That's good. Fighters with zero range and support fighters will retreat immediately if the parent ship is destroyed. Interesting. Uh, collisions with friendly ships no longer have a chance to cause a flame out when using plasma burn, burn drive, and similar ship systems with friendly ships. When the lower calls a flame out. That's weird. I didn't even know that was a problem. Uh, ships with S mods built in are now always recoverable after combat, just like ships with S modded regular hull mods. Huh? S modded built in hull mods are now always recoverable after combat, just like ships with S modded regular hull mods. So I'm guessing the ships that you would find with S mods were always recoverable, but now the ones that you build in are also always recoverable. That's nice. Um, I didn't realize that was a thing. Uh, definitely means that um, there's a way, like, I don't, like, hull restoration is now buffed, where it's like, I want to take it anyway. But not having it, if you have the extra story points to build in an S-Mod to all of your ships, you can now get around hull restoration being as super important. So now you can just build any S-Mod in. And with uh, things like, especially um, Insulated Engine Assembly, and some of the other S-Mod bonuses that you can get, this is now like, that's a buff to S-Mods across the board. I like that. That's nice. Um, fixed ship deployment issue that caused certain predictable slash poor behavior, such as redacted ships always being deployed last by the enemy. Okay. More broadly, ships that are stronger will no longer be so likely to be deployed last. That's That's good. Like, that would always be an issue, is, like, you finally get through a tough fight, and then you realize, oh, you didn't even see the flagship yet. <laughs> mm. 
Ship AI. Excuse me, I'm chewing on some uh, lemon cake. Mm. Ship AI is probably my number one source of frustration in this game. I'm always happy to see buffs and changes to the ship AI. Fix an issue that caused ships to fire torpedoes at frigates more liberally than intended. Thank God. <laughs> These officers, <clears throat> whether they hit a ship, a frigate with a torpedo or not, is so, like, ugh. Especially considering most of the, the torpedoes that I employ are Cyclone Reapers. Like, please don't fire at frigates. <laughs> it's not necessary. <laughs> uh fix an issue that could cause the AI to miss badly when taking manual control of certain weapons that were already not already pointed towards the target. Uh, didn't realize that was a problem. Glad they fixed it. Improved manual handling of use less for shields weapons such as the mining blaster and the IR auto lance. Uh, now aware of faster time flow for the purpose of collision avoidance. That one's really important. Those little scarabs were awful little bastards bumping into everyone when they were using their ship skill. So hopefully that we'll actually see this be a thing. Although I would like to point out that they mentioned in the last patch notes that they were going to call that phase ships would now be handled better. And I have not actually seen that be the case. I still see ships trying to become one with each other. Um, so we'll see how much this actually helps. Uh, fix issue causing it to turn off the front shields when given treat order. Okay. I didn't know that it did, they did that. That's nice. <laughs> Improve the use of high energy focus ship system. Should save the last charge for more important weapons. <laughs> Glad to hear this. I always was wondering if um, high energy focus was really being utilized correctly by uh, AI ships. And uh, apparently it was not. <laughs> At least not as well as it could have been. This issue with the phase skimmer being sometimes used aggressively by a retreating ship. Confused with what that means. Are they saying that it would be, ships used to phase out and head towards the enemy? When they were supposed to be retreating? If that's the case, then yeah, that's a good change. Uh, fix, fixed issue with threat of flash bombers being evaluated incorrectly. Okay, did not know that was a problem. Steady personality will now also maintain missile range with PD and missile ships. Previously, this required cautious or timid. Hmm. So, are they saying that steady ships used to just move out of missile range? I'm not sure... I mean, it sounds like it's a it's a it's a nice change, but I'm just not sure how that used to work. Um, possibly fixed or improved issue with Fury Odyssey and ships with similar systems ramming stations. So that's good to know. I mean, I don't use those ships quite a uh, that often. The Fury and the Odyssey, like Fury, to me is very low tier. I might be wrong on this. Again, I don't use the cruisers and capital ships all that much. But to me, it always seemed like, why would you take the Fury over the Aurora? <laughs> or, like, but, I don't know. But I guess if, uh, if they're ramming stations, you definitely don't want them. But now they'll do it less? Fix or improve the issue, so maybe it's not completely fixed. It'll, it's just going to be funny to see. Uh, that's interesting. Maybe we'll include a Fury or two in the fleet just to see if we can observe this behavior. Um, now knows, now knows about selecting an empty weapon group if all groups are auto-firing. What? Of oh, the AI, so ship AI, now knows about selecting an empty weapon group or, or one with the least firepower if all groups are auto-firing. I did not realize that this could potentially be an issue. <laughs> that, uh, depending on how you group the weapons, that the AI may accidentally turn off their auto-firing. So this is something that I do in my own ships where I'll select an empty weapon group to make sure all my weapons are auto-firing. So it's good to see that now the AI is thinking about that now. And it's not capable of manually firing an auto-fire group if it's selected for whatever reason. <clears throat> it sounds like it's a good change. 
Um, fix some ship, some phase ship collision avoidance issues when trying to get to the other side of a station. I mean, hopefully they just fix them in general because they don't seem to have actually been fixed. Fix issues that cause DEM missiles to be inappropriately prioritized by shields when already firing at something else. Uh, prioritized by shields. Okay, so it's like it used to be that DEM missiles would pull the ships. The AI ship's shields to prioritize them when perhaps they should be pointing it at something else instead. All right, that's good. That's good to hear. Although I would really like to see them prioritize their shields to a Dragonfire missile, but in general, this is probably a good change. All right, ship, 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 ships. <clears throat> Gremlin made the Ford hard points on the sprite larger in line with other small hard points. Uh, Omen. May sprites have more color, so it doesn't look grayscaled. It's my favorite ship, so I'm gonna just, we'll see that for sure. Uh, the auto-firing changes seem really significant. Is the implication that they weren't using any auto-fire group if it was their selected group? I believe that is what they were saying. Is that if... Uh, so, like, for example, if you put all the weapons into one weapon group, then it would not be on auto-fire, air quotes, if they had that group selected. So, yeah, this is something that's... Uh, a pretty good change, if that is how I'm understanding it correctly. So now instead of being stuck on that auto fire group, they'll recognize that they need to be on an empty group so that that skill or that group will now fire correctly. It, it does sound like that. That's actually a pretty big change for the AI that uh, that they'll start behaving like this now. I still wish that they would not select groups that I have on auto fire. Period, because the whole point of having them on auto fire is that I don't that I want them on auto fire. Uh, yeah, it's something that like it might make the AI more fearsome. Yeah, um, I mean, it doesn't seem like something that has been an issue with the way that the with the custom loadout or the automatic the uh, not custom loadouts, but the uh, the default loadouts. I think have been and, and if you just use default weapon grouping, I don't think this has been. An, that much of an issue but if you use custom weapon groupings this is probably something that is a very welcome change like it may have been that people didn't realize they were actually nerfing their ships with their loadouts and now it's not going to be as much of an issue if it is an issue at all brawler lg centurion lg increased op by two those are the lion's guard i forgot that there was a lion's guard version of the brawler so now they get a little bit of an ordnance point boosty. That's nice. Makes them a little bit more... Um, like, they don't just have a paint job and a debuff. Now they actually have something useful. They probably should have done that with all the Lion's Guard ships, just giving them an OP boost. Because that's in line with the Dictat in general and their fleet doctrine. More gun, more better. So I, I, I like this change. It's still not going to make me want to seek out Lions Guard Brawlers at all. I could care less. The other three Brawlers... In fact, I completely forgot that there was a Lions Guard Brawler. Not gonna lie. <laughs> to me, there's only three Brawlers. The regular gold, the and the two shiny variants, the blue and the red. <laughs> Which, I'm not sure if the, the LP Brawler got a change up last time and I just didn't notice it, but it seems a little less red to me. Um, added the Grendel class phase cruiser, low tech, ready construction, accelerated ammo feeder. That's nice. Uh, this is one that I was looking at and I'm kind of excited about this because this is something that you see in a lot of, um, ship packs It's essentially a destroyer class gremlin. And, uh, so now we have the Grendel, which takes that place. It's nice because, um, phase ships always felt like you didn't have a lot of options in the vanilla game. Especially if you were looking at destroyer class phase ships, like five Grendels may actually be the the move if you're trying to have low uh, a low sensor profile. Uh, Carl Luna is uh, Carl Carol right? Carol Luna. Thank you for the follow. <laughs> Don't know why I thought it was Carl. <laughs> My apologies. Um. But yeah, let's go look at that one a little closer real quick. Actually, hold on. Let me, before I jump over there, let me look at the uh, the second note. 
Missile Auto Forge now has two uses, restores the base unmodified amount of ammo and costs a bit less flux to use. It's more likely to use the Missile Auto Forge. Huge nerf. <clears throat> this used to be stupid strong because of the fact that if you had expanded missile racks and an officer with missiles, one use of this was just so good. But now that it has two uses, it does make me flying it a little bit better. Uh, I don't know. This is this is kind of a, just a straight up nerf. The situations where it's not are too niche. And being more likely to use the Missile Auto Forge, I guess, is nice, though. But I almost never have a Griffin flying that I'm not piloting. So for me, this is just a nerf and not really that great. But, um, I don't know, maybe if people have Griffins set up for support in their fleet or, you know, however they have them set up, they may have been noticing this issue. So perhaps this is a buff for some people if that means the ships are going to actually use their skills. Yeah, for me, it's, it definitely seems like it's more of a nerf. Um, I can't get to the codex now. You know what? Let's go ahead and start our game. Just to have... Uh, get to that starting screen. And I, that way I can get to the codex. Ugh. <clears throat> <clears throat> Randall. Randall. This thing. I like the design. Like I said before, a lot of people have kind of done this in ship packs where they literally just welded two gremlins together and called it a day. This is kind of nice. I like the. It still has that feel. But if you look, it's actually got a lot of weapon mounts on it, too. Uh, we got three small missiles. That's who's up front. Five medium ballistics. Oh, that's these here. Five medium ballistics and seven small ballistics. What's the ordnance points cost? 150. It's a cruiser. Oh, I thought it was a destroyer. This is a cruiser. Interesting. This is a this is a nice ship. This is a very interesting ship. Okay. All right. Rugged construction, distributed fire control. I forget what distributed fire control does. Um, that was one that they brought in for uh, the, what you call it, Invictus, right? Yeah, distributed fire control. I forget exactly what that what it does. But, yeah, making this a cruiser. Okay. And it's got the accelerated ammo feeder. I'm definitely going to have to try out having some of these in my fleet. Could, it'll be interesting to see how they work out. And the rugged construction is nice, too. I'm always a big fan of the gremlins having that rugged construction. It essentially lets them suit their purpose, which is to run around and be annoying. <laughs> and if they get blown up, that's their job. Lowers duration of damaged weapons by 50%. Yeah, if you could um, double-check that real quick, because I don't re quite remember what it does. We'd have to get one in-game in order to really check it out. Um, hold on a second, I'm going to find that out. It's called Distributed Fire Control. Star Sector. Um, much of the damage that takes weapons offline is to external controls. The ship's weapons are engineered to operate more independently, reducing their exposure to damage by 50%, and reducing EMP damage taken by the ship overall by 50%. Very nice for a phase ship. So yeah, this thing is absolutely more combat ready than the typical phase ship. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that affects the fleet meta. I don't think for... Like, even for people who take larger fleets in, like, this is a nice ship to have. The maneuverability of having the phase ship in general. What's its speed? Because the Gremlin is abominably slow. Top speed 60. I think that's exactly the same. No, no. It's not exactly the same. But <clears throat> with the phasing, that helps out quite a bit. Uh, 
Um, hmm. Interesting. I'm very, uh, I'm excited to see how this plays out. And um, especially when, in how the AI uses it. Like, we'll definitely have to see how that works out. Like, I'm, I'm wondering what fleets will utilize that. Like, and is there any variants of it? it? Doesn't say there's any variants of it, so I guess we won't see any pirate ones. All right, hull mods, max burns. Max burn eight isn't the worst though. Like having a cruiser that has a max burn of eight is all right. Anyway, <clears throat> integrated point defense AI clarified that the S mod effect does not affect strike weapons. Okay. Escort package is back in a very different incarnation. I didn't realize this was a thing. Oh, 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 oh. I remember what this was. So, this allows a destroyer or cruiser that is within a larger ship's range to get 25% maneuverability, 10% top speed, and 20% weapons range. When a large ship is a capital, these bonuses are doubled when it's a destroyer escort. Very nice. For destroyers, when S modded, also grants 20% reduced shield damage when in proximity. So this really makes escort ships really good. I was already a fan of escort ships when I'm doing larger fleets. Um, this now makes them... like this. This is really nice. This is fantastic. This is a huge, huge buff. Quite enjoy that. Um, yeah, this is just all around great. I had no complaints. I mean, it would be nice if it, if you could put it on a frigate. That's my only complaint. <laughs> like, I I think these bonuses should be similar. If you put put them on a uh, put the uh, escort package onto a frigate and it's around a cruiser, makes you want to play another carrier group. Yeah, I mean. The bigger bonuses are for capital ships, but I don't know, I've never been a big fan of the Astral. But even just having your destroyers accompanying herons and whatnot. Okay, safety overrides. Can no longer be installed on ships with flux shunt. In other words, the monitor. Um, Alright, whatever. I ain't too stressed about that. Um, I guess it makes sense. But I don't really care. <laughs> uh, auxiliary thrusters reduces the OP cost. S mod bonus is increased. Zero flux speed boost by 10 and doubles the zero flux turn rate bonus. The base zero flux turn rate bonus is a flat 10 degrees per second. Um, okay. So that's a buff to auxiliary thrusters, which is great because I almost never use them myself. Uh, I still think the OP cost is a bit steep, but at least this makes them a little bit more viable. I, I feel like if you need this, what you actually need is uh, helmsmanship, but um, this is this is nice. It's nice to see mods that I would not typically use getting a buff to at least make me think about using them, when I probably still won't anyway. Uh, weapons. Dragonfire. Increase activation range by 100 units. That's nice. Keeps it further out of PD range. Uh, light dual auto cannon. Increase flux per shot back to 40. Was 30. Light dual auto cannon. I forget which one that is. Uh, back, back. Exit. No, 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 no. Not exit. Back. Uh, weapons. Light is gonna be in our light light dual auto cannon. Oh, the little the little pea shooter. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> I guess it's a problem. Okay. Um, heavy auto cannon reduced flux for shot. Now the heavy auto cannon that's gonna be the 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 medium version, right? Heavy auto cannon, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have uh, reduce. That, that's nice because I always felt like the heavy auto cannon just wasn't 
wasn't valuable enough considering it takes 10 ordnance points and a medium ballistic slot. It didn't seem that super great aside from the, the, the range. I almost always wanted something else in that slot. But now that it's it's got a little bit of a buff, I still probably won't think about it, but that's nice. Uh, phase Lance, reduce flux to damage to 0 0.8, was 1.2. Yeah, Phase Lance got a huge buff. That is a huge reduction in the flux cost. I remember seeing that that was coming down the pipeline. Somebody mentioned that in chat at one point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's going to make uh, Phase Lances a lot more viable on smaller ships, which I think was the only place that they were really viable. Uh... I like putting them on the Harbinger myself. So, yeah, I'm happy to see that. Um, Volition Particle Driver. I think that's one of the newish ones that's hard to find. Uh, increase the range, reduce the flux per shot. That's just nice because, I mean, like, as it was, it didn't seem that good to want to struggle to go get. <coughs> volatile, not Volition. What am I saying? Volatile Particle Driver. Uh, I'm still interested to see how it really differentiates itself from the hypervelocity driver. Um, because to me, with how difficult the volatile driver is to get... Oh, it's not even in this list. Maybe it's under particle driver? Where is it? Would it be in a driver? Is it just not in here? So I know there's certain things that are just not in here. I guess it's just not in here. <clears throat> well, Oh, well. Uh, Hephaestus Assault Gun. Reduce flux per shot by 10. Which is nice. I like the Hephaestus Assault Gun. Uh, Storm Needler. Change to use regenerating ammo. Max ammo 60. Reload size of 30. 10 ammo a second. Improves accuracy and doubled the rate of fire. It's the same DPS is same as current. Burst DPS is similar to 3 times Heavy Needler. Okay. So this just changes around how the needler works. I'm not sure I like this, though, because if the other needlers aren't getting changed as well, then this just makes an inconsistency throughout the needler tree. Like, the the last one, the, the storm needler now behaves very differently than the other two. Um, but it does make playing around them a little better, because now you can, like, trick the shots out get them to spam it out, and then move in. <clears throat> I'm not sure how I feel about that. I don't know if this was needed. I don't know why this change came. Anyway, Squall, reduced missile hit points to 150, was 300. So that's going to... That, that That's fair. Those things come in so fast that the, it's, the PD has a big trouble trying to stop them. So that's, that's probably fair. Locus SRM... Reduced burst size to 30 was 40. Um, that's also fair. <laughs> the Logos SRM is so oppressive, especially against uh, frigates. Like, you don't... It doesn't matter that it's dealing fragmentation damage. You're hitting with so many missiles. So that's that's definitely a fair change. Um, all the gazers are getting changed. The T The... SRM and SRM pots. This is the first one. Increase the cooldown to 15. Reduce the OP cost. That's nice. Gazer, SRM, increase the cooldown. Reduce cost. I'm glad to see that. Uh, very rarely did I consider taking these over similarly costed weapons. Um, the cooldown nerf would probably be felt by some players who really like these. But honestly, the reduced OP cost. That's a, that's a fair trade-off as far as I'm concerned. Maybe makes them more uh, interesting to take. And the Gordon sees a similar reduction at the uh, small uh, launcher. Interesting they didn't change the medium Gorgon. Huh. Uh, Salamander, MRM, reduce OP cost to three. Ah! And the pod reduced to six. This 
is a huge change for me. Uh, quite annoying, though, because it means we're going to probably see a lot more of them on enemy ships. But these, the salamanders are just so useful. And it was always a pain with how much they cost, considering how slow they were to reload. And this now makes them very, like, much easier to, to equip on some of the smaller ships. And to just throw them into on larger ships as well. Especially this, this here. Like the, 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 the pod getting reduced to 6 from 10. That's a huge buff. Charge launcher increase refire delay to 2 seconds was 1. Happy to see that. Charge launcher spam is so annoying. <laughs> Especially because when you put the charge launcher on ships, they tend to just spam them out so quickly that they barely last in a fight. Like They, all, they run out of ammo so quickly. So I'm glad to see this on both the enemy not spamming them out as much. And both and my team hopefully reserving some and not spamming them out completely. Oh, then a bunch of modding notes, a bunch of bug fixes. Um, okay, some of these look like they're interesting. Uh, fixed case where if you sold slash lost item you were sent to recover by the Glacier Academy, it will be Sebastian rather than some random officer who will request the return of the Burzer's money. Okay. Uh, fix the dialogue loop with Caden during the air. Uh, fix the ability to leave. Uh, blah. Fix double responses when negotiating with Pather base commander. When uh, gave Contest Den a story flag so that it can't deceive. Thus break. Okay, to civilize. Okay, so Contest Den can no longer decivilize. I didn't realize that was a thing that could happen. So glad that they did that. Uh, removed extraneous name after colony name in the population infrastructure tooltip. Okay. Fixed issue with extra bonus XP being gained if multiple ships with S mods were lost and not recovered. Okay. I mean, I don't, that's not something that's going to come up for me, but it's good to know that that was fixed. Uh, fixed text issue with scattered ruins on gastrons. Fixed ECM package S mod effect not working. <laughs> Didn't know that was a thing. Again, happy to see it's fixed. Uh, fixed weapon group generation error that sometimes unnecessarily put a weapon in a separate group. Okay. Fixed refit screen issue that allowed going over the XOP limit with when building in hull mods. Fixed issue with auto fit and shield shunt slash makeshift shield generator. Uh, fixed breach SRM pod showing wrong speed description. Fixed issue where a weaker fleet would sometimes pursue the player but try not to engage. That's good to know. I, I've seen that happen. Fixed issue where redacted fleets counted on nearby dormant fleets to join the fight when deciding whether to attack the player. That's good to know. <laughs> I didn't realize that they were doing that. That explains some behavior that I've been seeing when exploring. Um, so that's, that's good to know that they fixed that. Because that, that was always kind of silly. That, that makes some more sense now. Why? Because I would see that where redacted fleets would be like posturing in ways that I wasn't expecting them to. And now I know why, because they were counting on dormant fleets to join the fight. Uh, more S mod XP getting boosted correctly. Fixed commodity pricing issues when dealing with very large numbers of units bought slash sold. Good to hear, because that does happen. I, I've noticed this sometimes. So I'm glad that's working. I'm working for content dialogues, being able to fire the wrong follow-up text. Okay. Uh, fixed being able to S mod already built in whole mods without having enough story points. Interesting. I don't know how that works out. Uh, possibly fix alt timing issues on some systems when in undecorated full screen window. I haven't noticed that myself, but maybe some people have been having problems with that. Sometimes cause patrols to pursue and repeatedly re-engage a player fleet and then maintain a neutral stance. I've definitely seen that. Fish, fixed issue with the Sunders shield radius being bigger than its collision radius. Interesting. Yeah, Sunders a weird one because it's so long that the shield has to be so wide. Uh, fixed combat UI display issue with burst beam cooldown would also allow a burst beam extra turn speed during the very end of its cooldown period. Okay. Uh, fixed issue with restore button still having the can't be restored tooltip when switching to a ship that can be restored. 
Oh, I didn't know that was a problem. Uh, lighting at alpha site is now ambient, no longer directional from the center, which has no light source. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I see now. I see what that's an issue. Right, right, right. Alpha site was what I was thinking of earlier. Uh, fix several issues in the making a deal with the Pirate Station King dialogue. Fix a repeated, repeatable section of the Yannick Ram dialogue. Fix issue that caused fleets in locations where the player isn't to have some trouble using jump points. I've, I saw something about that uh, in one of the other f fixes. Um, fix minor placement issue with the Sunder's turrets. Fix cost of the Gazer SRM pod. Oh, maybe that change was a uh, cost, so the price cost. Fix issue with hostile fleets spawning too quickly in any colonized system other than the first. I didn't know that was a problem. <clears throat> I guess that makes sense. Uh, fix issue with the historian donations not actually being deducted from the player's credits. <laughs> Didn't know that was a thing. Star fortresses of all tech levels now have a basic description of their drones in the station tooltip. Good to know. Fix issue with commerce related bounty not going away if the commerce industry is shut down. Fix fusion lamp glow showing on other planets in the intel screen while docked at a planet with a lamp. Didn't notice this. I'm surprised I hadn't noticed this. Uh, fixed infinite story point exploitation and character screen. Didn't know about that. Fixed uh, market appearing in orbital station tooltip. Arms dealers no longer offer old style D pulls for production. I didn't notice this before. What are that like? What that looks like? Like I'm guessing that means like the broke versions of ships where they've updated the sprites. I'm not sure. Uh, Marines in the storage and local resources no longer count for ground defenses against bombardments. Still do count against raids. I didn't know that was a thing. <clears throat> hmm. Okay, okay, okay. I see what's going on here. That that's. I wonder if that's been a thing on both sides. Where it's like you attack a place that has a lot of marines, and that those marines were helping with the defense against bombardments. Like that seems like it's a good fix for uh, for players versus um, NPC, like uh, enemy factions. You know, just doing raids and bombardments in general. That seems like a good fix. It's uh, definitely a needed fix, though, on the other side as well. It'd be kind of silly if you had a bunch of marines in storage, and then they're protecting against bombardments. Okay, um, so that is all of it. Uh, still quite a bit in here. Um, definitely excited to see how the new skills end up playing things out, but what I'm most excited to get in and mess around with is the new colony, the new colony system stuff. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do now. Going to, uh... Uh, make sure to double check to make sure I went over all this stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Skill tweaks. Um, I don't want to go into that. I've already got my patch. Don't need that. Don't need that. All right, let's get into the game.